like he's going to interview me. And I can't imagine that's going to go well, but I'm going to do it. Especially after having like that conversation with Roger, I'd be like, okay, listen. But what do I care? You like, attack me. This, you know, I know what I believe and I know who I am. And like nothing Roger says changes the fact of anything for me. Like okay. I know who I am. Yeah. Like, you know what? I know what I believe. I know what yeah. I'm trying to do. I know. It, like, and it was always weird, like, because the, the Free State Project was like that to Indiana, because the simple fact that, like, you know, what is the largest concentration of uh, most libertarians in a small state? Indiana. Right. It's Indiana. You know? What about Nebraska? Again, there's probably one, but there's not many people there in Wyoming, and they're right. dotted around, and a lot of them are dotted into, like, heavily, like, massive, like, population centers. Right. You know, it's... All right, let's get started. I, I, got, a, I got a lot to oh, get yeah, I've, my Oh, yeah, I've got so much, and it's just like, and then I've, like... I was like, I've got Wednesdays a bit, too, so I'll be okay. Yeah, there's, all right, well, I'm going to just, uh, for you Facebookers and YouTubers, I'm just going to disconnect. Uh, that sucks. How many How many of these damn iRigs am I going to have to buy? Uh, it's okay. It's okay. 2019, we'll have a studio, mm -hmm. and OBS will be run in, and we'll have, like, nice cameras. It'll be awesome. Yes. Yeah. Switch your board. How's that, Brantley? How, how is it now? Check and see, please. Uh, if not, what we'll do is we will just uh, record... And see how it goes. Brantley Spicer. I think he said butt tolerable. He's butt tolerable. Let's go over here. Uh, Condi, Condi Rice. We'll, uh, let's... What is butt tolerable? Uh, <laughs> his butt's tolerable. That's very immature. <laughs> it's very immature. <laughs> I can hear you. With no, he said he could hear us with no buzzing. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, yeah, my man. my friend Melissa, she t she tweeted out uh, what she say. Um, profile. I'm killing it on Twitter, by the way. If you don't follow me on Twitter, you should. Uh, well, you do too much. I have too much going on. There's too much going on. Too much, too much me for a lot of people. I get it. I've got it. Bring it. So Melissa said. Uh, Chris Spangle, talented writer and political commentator, intelligent. Also, since Snapchat said the Snapchats of the Spice Cumin because he's secretly twelve. <laughs> okay. Listen, it looks like coming, so I think it's hilarious. Sue me. Uh, all right, here we go. Let's get started. Don't tell me you pronounce still it, uh, Uranus, Uranus, right? You've grown up and pronounce it Uranus now. Right? Uranus. <laughs> so still has it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should try it with the Mevo. Let's try it with the uh, Mevo. There we go. How about that, everybody? What? All right, we'll try it with this mic. That might be better. Yeah, I thought you were like, like some sort of like software that like linked in there. Nah. That's my only problem with the Mevo camera. Like if it would linked up to open up to use that type of software, I wait. Honestly, I, I kind of want to steal it from you for a week just to see if I can jailbreak it. It costs three hundred dollars, so if you break it, you buy it. <laughs> all right, here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves, while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective, with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes. That's super important, by the way. Five star reviews only, please. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe on Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. Listen. Damn it, Jeff Vivert. Uh, listen, everybody, I want you to know that Jeff Vivert is starting on a serious satellite radio show uh, starting on noon on Wednesday. So if you want to call in, say hi to Jeff Vivert and ruin his show like he ruins mine, please do the Barstool channel. All right, so please subscribe at Patreon. Independent media like this only exists because you give us the resources and the tools. We were talking about a camera issue that we've got, so that's going to be another $35 out of my pocket to replace this piece of equipment. Uh, and the $300 cameras acting up and all that stuff, all that adds up. So as And all those donations, uh, the $5 a month, $10, $25, or $100 a month at patreon.com slash we're libertarians. That's help, that helps, gives us equipment, access to sites like the New York Times, and all of our prep stuff. So, uh, in exchange for supporting our program, we give you all kinds of bonus content for free. There was an extra 30 minutes of content at the beginning of this podcast that you didn't hear unless you were getting the private RSS feed for Patreon subscribers. 
there is another show that is two hours long featuring Harry Price on Wednesdays that comes out on Thursday in the Private RSS. We give you a ton of bonus content because we thank you so much for being a Patreon subscriber. Now, we, uh, this show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag WALnews or WALpolitics. Or in our Facebook group and Discord channel, we are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wealllibertarians.com. Uh, if you've written me, I've just not written you back yet. I've read them, I promise. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. And I'm going to warn you right now, this is going to be a little bit more of... Uh, it, it's not going to be an adult-natured show, but we're going to use the president's words, and we're going to talk about the Aziz Ansari, so if you are listening uh, in the car with the kids, then just be advised. Um, we're, not, we're not going to be like CNN and put this out on uh, push notifications and say the S-word, uh, but we are going to talk about Aziz Ansari, and that's an adult situation. We're going to talk about the immigration S-hole comments. Uh, we're going to talk about Schools outlawing best friends. I, for one, wish they'd outlaw Jeff Ebert. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, the Me Too stuff. But, uh, yeah, I, I yeah, we're going to start with Martin Luther King and, uh, and you people. Uh, because, now, I look at Harry Price. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry, how are you doing today? Doing good. How are you? Good. Harry is uh, my co-host here on the Tuesday show, and... Hey, Harry, did you have a nice Martin Luther King Day? Sure did, yep. Uh, do what I do on every Martin Luther King Day. Uh, I read, you know, speeches, books, educate black youth online. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to, like, find some young up-and-coming um, crap poster and decide to uh, just, like, hammer their world out with, like, just go, like, hard in the paint with some hard black facts on them. Now I uh, am. Now I ask for your permission. May I like Martin Luther King? Let me check your balance. I'm on the racism insurance. Yeah, yeah, you can. All right, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Outside of the founding fathers, I think Martin Luther King is one of the most extraordinary Americans uh, ever to live. Because, and I think if you go back and listen to the episode that we did about it last year, that was sort of at the conclusion of several months of study on the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, reading the Taylor Branch series, uh, Parting the Waters being the first, and watching the entire PBS series called uh, Eyes on the Prize, as well as a few other books. Like, I, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you get such a great inside knowledge of the civil rights movement, and you really see how, how there's a pat there is a playbook for libertarians in all of this. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther King was somebody who was an imperfect person who was pushed to the front of, a, of an imperfect movement mm -hmm. and within a decade was able to use nonviolence to completely change society to the point that the former head of the, pre of the Senate in LBJ, who in the Senate was blocking every civil rights legislation, was an awful racist. Yep signed the Civil Rights Bill as president because political will and societal will had shifted so much mm -hmm. in a span of 10 years. And uh, it was because he acted nonviolently and his opposition acted violently. Correct, yeah. I mean, he was an extraordinary human being in the, in the Civil Rights. I mean, he's one of the heroes. I mean, everybody puts him up as the... And I think he would be... I think he'd be unhappy with an, an MLK day. I think he would be unhappy that he was the singular focus of the civil rights movement for so many people um, but part of that comes from his assassination because you know Ralph Abernathy people like Rosa Parks Stokely mm -hmm. Carmichael uh, who, who's the the congressman uh, John Lewis um, Andrew J Andrew uh, is it Andrew Jones he went on to be the the UN uh, Andrew uh, gosh I'm spacing it um, Tall, handsome dude went on to be the head of the NAACP. Head of the, he was the UN I ambassador. Keep on Johnson. I think you screwed me up. I, I know. Got it wrong. It, but it's Andrew Young. It was Andrew Young. <laughs> so it was like I had it, and you said James. I was like, what? Right. Lots of lots of great civil rights leaders, even people like Malcolm Malcolm X to some extent, mm -hmm. 
but but Martin Luther King just his his oratory was unlike anything that exists on the planet today. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you go back and you listen to his speeches. I listened to the mountaintop speech mm-hmm. this morning, mm-hmm. which he was very sick and he had the flu and he didn't he didn't go to the church in Memphis uh, that night. And then they said, "You got to come down here. It's it's packed to the rafters. People want to see you." So he came down, and he was he was very prepared with his speeches, and he stood up in one of the rare speeches where he spoke extemporaneously without notes, and just crushed it. I mean, if you don't have the hair on the every hair on your body standing on end by the end of I've seen the mountaintop, mm-hmm. uh, I've been to the mountaintop, you, you're not human, and uh, then he is assassinated the next morning. Correct. So, and he just, apparently, he collapsed at, at the end of that speech, and just, it was, it's incredible uh, to, to listen to his words. Mm-hmm. So, what, what's, you listen to his speeches every year? Yes. Yes, I try to. Because, you know, it's, one, I, uh, it, you are correct, uh, he's a great orator, and this is the fact that you will never, especially in this 24-hour news cycle, I think, um, on the boondocks, like a... Uh, James Magruder uh, brought up on this like it's just you can't be uh, Martin Luther King and speak like that and be on the news anymore he right. just speaks like even I I speak very very quick very very fast and I you know just because that's you know the society that's where we've grown up on mm-hmm. this is what we've done we've always speak, spoken that fast and someone speaking that slowly <laughs> right. and pronouncing every word <laughs> and trying to get that, that cadence in there that doesn't work for TV and the simple fact, and uh, I think the, uh, that's another thing I'll actually like to watch for Martin Luther King, King Day, is the um, Boondock Martin Luther King episode, when they do the, basically, the dream, the fiction episode, where he didn't die, he went into a coma, and came back. Right. You know, and, and he was, you know, he's still around, and just to show you how, in a different land, in a different world, and how different of the way people would act to Martin Luther King. Yeah, and one of the things that I hate about... Martin Luther King Day mm-hmm. is all the Republicans that try to make him a Republican, and then all the Libertarians and Conservatives mm-hmm. that try to make him a Communist. Yep. And yep. I, I, you know, the the truth is that yes, he was uh, sympathetic to socialism. His wife was an avowed socialist when they met, mm-hmm. and he writes to her in in his letters, basically saying, "I'm sympathetic and I understand the problems of capitalism." But I, I, I'm not willing to give up on it yet. And towards the end of his life, he did become more anti-capitalism. But I think if you're Martin Luther King and you've spent 15 years in the middle of all these fights between institutional racism in local businesses and local governments, mm-hmm. I think it's a perfectly rational position for Martin Luther King Jr. to have a, sus- a suspicion of free markets. Because... Free markets weren't acting rationally to him, so why would he think that capitalism could act rationally? And I think taking those statements, uh, and again, it doesn't make him right, I just see how he can come to that conclusion based on his experiences. And taking those statements and then applying it to today's politics, when Martin Luther King existed in a time when political parties were totally empty vessels, Republicans... Uh, were suspicious of civil rights and and weren't really willing to do a lot. And then Democrats, you had JFK Democrats, mm-hmm. and then you had Robert Byrd Democrats. Right. You know, uh, everybody points out, oh, well, uh, Governor Wallace was a Democrat. Yeah, he was, yes, but he was. so was JFK. I mean, you didn't have the kind of homogenization in the political parties then that you do now, and it was just a very different time 50 years ago in every aspect of our politics. Mm-hmm. And to take like Martin Luther King's views on politics in a time that it were vastly different than the Internet age, mm-hmm. you can't say that, oh, I think he'd love Donald Trump, or I think he'd hate Donald Trump. I just, like, I think he'd hate Donald Trump. But I think he'd pray for Donald Trump. I think he'd pray for Donald Trump. <laughs> but Martin Luther King was extremely careful to never wade into any political discussion that didn't directly affect the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. Because his position was always, I don't want to get, I don't want to say something that will turn a potential ally off. And it wasn't until Vietnam, when he spoke out against Vietnam in 1967, that that, what, what he said he wouldn't do, because if he did it, it, it happened, and mm-hmm. he basically divided 
his movement, he divided his supporters, he divided he, all his, all the suspicious silent majority said, see, he's a, he's a, he's a communist, mm -hmm. and, you know, he... And that's when the FBI the investigations got in really good and, on him. And by, by his death, he really was very, uh, he, his power had greatly di diminished, which is really odd, which, because I don't know why, if his power diminished, the Dulles brothers assassinated him. Uh, which is my view. I think the CIA at the time, the Dulles brothers, are two of the most evil Americans ever to live, mm -hmm. uh, traitorous people. And I think if you do any research into them and the Kennedy assassinations and the Martin Luther King assassination, you see the paranoia within the FBI and the CIA that Martin Luther King was going to foment a, a race riots, which were already mm -hmm. happening in 1968. Yeah. And that he was going to be a, a bad actor. That he could convince all of Negro America to turn on the United States government. When in reality, if you look at his influence within the black movements of mm -hmm. that time, they had shifted more militant. They were heading towards Black Panthers and Black Power. Mm -hmm. And they were moving away from the then, I think at this point Malcolm X was assassinated, but you know, they were moving towards the Stokely Carmichaels and away from the Martin Luther Kings. Yeah, he was more of a trying to keep them peaceful, but they were, because they were met with such violence around that time. Right. And it was, to me, it looks almost like it wasn't for his assassination, they probably would have got violent. Because yeah. he even talks of, like, um, like uh, all black people trying to concentrate in one area and get there around it, whichever they had police and do everything themselves. Now, even up through all that violence, there's a lot of good, like, um, there's a lot of good programs that the Black Panther Party did do, and mm -hmm. a lot of good things that it did do. There's a lot more community aspects that happened through that. I'm sorry to ruin your Black Panther Party. <laughs> <laughs> Flush Forrest Gump a couple months ago. Such a great movie. Uh, this was from the, the actual, uh, I've been to the mountaintop speech. She said, when people get caught up with that which is right, and they're willing to sacrifice for it, there is no stopping point short of victory. And... I, I just said, libertarians, your job is to find that which is right so that people will sacrifice to win, not what you think is right. There's often a big difference. And what I mean by that statement is that so often we think that the issues that we are interested in or the issues that we know to be the underlying problems, those are the right issues to fight, but m people aren't willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. to 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 the ends that it takes to be victorious. I was talking today to somebody, I was talking with a group of libertarians today about uh, education. Well, yes, every libertarian should agree that there shouldn't be public schools or that there should be, uh, there should be public schools, but you should also have the legal right to send your children to other schools. Or uh, uh, basically that what we have now, which is a public school monopoly, mm -hmm. is not the right solution. And I think any libertarian would agree with that point. Maybe not all libertarians would agree that there shouldn't be public schools. Um, but I, I don't think there should be. <laughs> but the well, well the, the idea of having a free education system is a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, the idea, but more, the we hate the way it's funded and the monopoly aspect. That's right. you, you hit on the nail on the head. Like, we hate the monopoly aspect on it and the simple fact the way it's funded. If it was funded through charity, organizations... And there was multiple choices that you could pick them, like a market could decide on the um, mm -hmm. which school survives, which school goes down. You know, that's what we want. You know, that's like, they're like, all oh, these charter schools went down. Yeah, those charter schools suck. Right. You know, there's other charter schools that are thriving. They're doing well. The, the force of government has created education so educational systems that don't fit the 21st century workforce. Yeah. And so... Completely. So these, these libertarians were arguing that school choice and vouchers shouldn't exist because libertarians should only advocate for the end of all public schooling. And I said, all right, let's, let's, let's accept the premise that every libertarian agrees with you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, we've now won 3% of the nation. <laughs> and 3% th of the voting public, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. half the nation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Let's say we... we do what we've done for 50 years, which is keep advocating that point of view and keep shrinking that 3%. Because the reality is that society at large is not ready to accept a full end to public education. They, 
and even here in Indiana, it's in the Indiana Constitution. Mm -hmm. Robert Owen and the Owenites, who found a new harmony, socialism, one of the first socialist communist experiments, was here in Indiana, in southern Indiana, with the Owenites. And they put into the Indiana Constitution the public school fund, the common school fund. And so mm -hmm. it is in the Indiana Constitution that we are to have publicly funded schools. And so to roll that back, the PR nightmare, the policy nightmare, the messaging nightmare of trying to argue against public schools mm -hmm. as a matter of policy perspective is a tremendous hardship. It's a tremendous undertaking. And it would require millions of dollars of lobbying efforts and public relations efforts. Mm -hmm. So you you end up getting yourself so far into the weeds that no one will listen to you anymore because you're advocating this crazy idea of ending public schools. And so what I said is, let's focus on what we can do now. Let's focus on where the public is at now and start moving them towards liberty and freedom. And mm -hmm. as they accept our ideas of something like vouchers where money follows the students right. as opposed to every school gets this amount based on enrollment, mm -hmm. which isn't working for us in Indianapolis and Indiana, let's change it to a voucher system where the money, where people have the money that it costs the state, mm -hmm. and they can then enroll their child in the school that they think fits their child best, yeah. yes. be it private or public. And Hopefully one day homeschool. And, and homeschooling. I yeah, would, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many single mothers that I think they would probably homeschool their kids if they were like, for each one of these kids you get 8000 that grant, like, oh, you're getting free money together, but yeah, but it's gonna either gonna go to these schools or go to a money pit, right? So, th getting, this I'm is getting, probably getting crapped on by every anarchist right. watching right now. So this is the problem that I have with the purely anarchical position: is that we're advocating for things that aren't going to actually happen in reality in our lifetime, and people are tuning us out because we are so far in in down the socialist rabbit hole that people don't even understand the language that we're speaking. Mm -hmm. And when you when you try to argue argue the purest positions, people don't listen to you. Yep. They think you're crazy. Right. They consider you Alex Jones conspiracy theorist by saying, I think your child should be educated in the best way possible, and you should have maximum choice over their education. And so that, that I think, is what, what King was saying is that Take the issues of injustice that are on the ground now and pick up the torch to fight for people who are being trampled on and fight for those people. And in the process of people seeing a reality-based situation that is incorrect, they will start to sacrifice everything they possibly can to give freedom and liberty back to not only that person but themselves. The number one episode that has ever been listened to on We Are Libertarians is episode 91. It is Rachel's story. It is the story of Woody talking about his daughter who was sent to prison for 16 years for selling two Oxycontin pills that her boyfriend was dealing and that he was sick and couldn't make the trade. So she did it, got busted, and ended up getting sentenced to 16 years in prison. Now, Rachel had a rare blood disease that the, uh, the privatized i.e. Monopoly, not monopolistic company that was doing Medicare for the prison system in Indiana named Corizon, mm -hmm. which thankfully has been kicked out of Indiana uh, for situations like this, Rachel wasn't getting the treatment and was basically left to die. She was Her care was so mismanaged that she hemorrhaged to death and Woody lost his daughter. And so for two hours you get to hear Woody tell his story of injustice. You, you listen to our cost series. Go to the cost, the human toll of public policy. You can find it at We Are Libertarians. You can listen to it in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. And you hear people talk about, there's eight stories in there of people who have had their businesses closed, their lives destroyed, their medication messed with, their daughters killed, their children raped, and the government allowed it. So often the government is the creator of the injustice. And the narrative of society today is that government is here to protect us. That government is here to save us. And it's about time that libertarians start standing up and saying, 
You know why this this happened? You know why this little child was not protected by DCS? Because government doesn't work, DCS doesn't work, and here's the solution to fix it. And we start advocating for private solutions that are not monopolies. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in privatization in the way that the government, in the way that Republicans describe privatization, because what they're doing is they're handing out major contracts to their donors. Right. And Democrats are handing out major monopolistic contracts to their donors. A company here in Indianapolis has a 50-year lease on the on the, uh, parking on the parking meters. Thank you, Harry. Uh, because there was a connection there. Mm -hmm. Somebody yes. had the connection. So 50 years, there's a monopolistic contract on our parking meters. Mm -hmm. Why should parking meters exist in the first place? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Violating all these storefront property rights. Right. And so you... Uh, you we have to start making a better case, and we have to start saying that children are poorly educated, that we're running behind because of these certain conditions and these certain things, and if we do this solution, then people will be more free. Martin Luther King was able to take real instances of injustice in his community and start building coalitions to fix that, in, that, that problem and start to carve out more liberty and freedom, and within a decade, he was able to change society. One man, one group, a person who was an imperfect person. He plagiarized his college stuff. He cheated on his wife. He, he did things that weren't holy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there isn't a single person listening today that isn't holy. And the only time that people make an issue of somebody like Martin Luther King's imperfections is when they have a political point to make and they want to diminish the actual good works of what the man did. And so when I see a site like Liberty Hangout posting some bullshit garbage article about how Martin Luther King was a socialist and nobody should listen to him, I'm saying the person that wrote that is lying to you and is manipulating you and is completely incorrect about Martin Luther King Jr., and that outlet should no longer be listened to because their credibility has been absolutely diminished because they're trying to make a point that doesn't make sense, that is completely false and inaccurate, and what is the point of it? Mm -hmm. It's because they're trying to manipulate you to think a certain way so they can gain favor with a certain segment of our population. People like Liberty Hangout or Tommy Lauren want to manipulate you into being part of their tribe. People like uh, the Young Turks want to manipulate you left and get you to think left so they can be part of their tribe. And so they basically are gaslighting you into believing a certain way. And so much of tonight's show is trying to combat, trying to give you a gut check of here's what reality says. So when you see all these things about how Martin Luther King Jr. plagiarized and cheated and was and believed in communistic ideals maybe some of that was true but that doesn't diminish the overarching mm -hmm. complete picture of his work which was absolutely libertarian in getting more people freedom more people liberty and creating justice where injustice had been before is that good yeah yeah, I always hate it. Like, yeah, because they wait till like Martin Luther King Day to like po start posting these manipulated articles for clicks, for money, and you know it's it's different if they would have posted it, you don't know, mid December, right? You know, or if they, and if they brought up some new information on it, like we've got this. This is what we just uncovered. Yeah. Okay. But they're not going to do that. But no, no, this is stuff people have been posting on the internet for since the internet on Martin Luther King Day, and you know trying to be edgy. Yeah. Look what we did. Edgy boy. Yeah. <laughs> As Count Dankula would say. Ooh, watch out for that box of knives. It's so much edge. Uh, all right. So, on to our next, uh, on to our next gut check. Uh, Donald Trump. How many of us are surprised to hear Donald Trump thinks that Haiti is a shithole? Anybody? Is, is this new information about Donald Trump that we must not have known before today? Is this new information about Donald Trump's character that we haven't been wrestling with for two years? Is there anything for us to really be outraged about? Like, a Democratic senator who wants to gain leverage and diminish the president's position leaked a comment that Donald Trump probably said, but we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. He leaked it for political mm -hmm. gain. 
Also, it's hilarious that Don, that Harry just belched, thought he muted his mic. I thought and, he did it. No, it didn't work. It uh, didn't work as well at all. I my whole button back. <laughs> no, because you would push the button and then you wouldn't click it off. So Donald Trump is under attack because, as we as we said last episode, Donald Trump is having uh, his mental fitness question. Donald Trump went for a physical at the Naval Hospital last Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, congratulations to Donald Trump. He is physically fit and has also grown one inch in the last five years, according to, <laughs> to, according to his driver's license. So his driver's license, uh, it says he's 6'2". So what you're saying, he's falsified his driver's license. Exactly. He said he's 6'2", and then he's 6'3", in the... Uh, 239 pounds of pure muscle and mental acuity. And uh, Donald Trump is in fighting shape, uh, according to the doctor. But I just, a raw story posted that he had grown an inch in his, in his later age. And I thought that was funny. But whose driver's license is actually correct? Mine says I'm 230 pounds. Yeah, I haven't, uh, yeah, I haven't updated mine since I, started, since I stopped fighting. Harry says he's Asian. Which, uh, first off, okay, um, you swore when you saw those two passports, you wouldn't bring those up. Uh-huh. Because I've got one that does say I'm Chinese, and the other one says I'm German. Right. And, uh, now, Don you. Donald Trump, when asked about this, said, of course I've grown an inch. I'm huge. <laughs> <laughs> so. Personally, I won't believe he's in physical fits, uh, fitness shape until he takes a bike ride with uh, Dr. Ron Paul in the summer. Yes. Find out who, you know, who, la who lasts the longest it's going to be well, Paul. So, so I'm just looking at all this, and I'm going, okay, listen. Is Donald Trump a dangerous person? King George III mad? King George III mad. Is he syphilitic? He's lost his mind. He's, he's a stark raving lunatic. He's schizophrenic. He needs doctors. No, he's not that. Is he well-read? Does he read books? No. Is he an intellectual? Mm -mm. When he is on television trying to look smart, trying to disprove that he isn't everything that Michael Wolff says he is, and he is in front of a bunch of congressmen, and one of them, a Democrat, asks, would you support a DACA clean bill? And he said, absolutely, I'd support that. I'd take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, do you have any fucking idea what a clean bill actually means? Because clearly you don't. You don't know that a clean bill means that you'd only vote for DACA and nothing else would be attached to it. You said, I'd support a clean bill. Then a few minutes later, I would, I would have a clean DACA bill, but we'd also have to add the wall into it. Well, that's not a clean bill anymore. So you can't be president of the United States and not know the basics of how government works. Clearly you can. <laughs> but clearly you can. So we're, we're in but, this situation, in this reality. See, so you're taking him literally, mm -hmm. okay, and you need to take him figuratively. Right. He wants the wall in there, but right. he would support a clean bill. Right. But he wants the wall in there. Right. Exactly right. <laughs> he would sign it faster if the wall was in there. Right. And, and, and I just, I see and interact with so many people who support Donald Trump, and they would just have so much more credibility if at some point in, discu in discussions with them, they would say, yes, I know he's a buffoon, but overall... He's succeeding in the two mandates that Donald Trump has. A, fulfill the uh, conservative appointments to the Supreme Court. But Gorsuch, done. Mandate filled. Number two, don't be Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Those are the two mandates that Donald Trump had, according yes. to, to uh, Jeffrey Goldberg. Mm -hmm. a a and, and he's exactly right. Like, don't be Hillary Clinton. That's why he brings her up all the time. He's reminding you, I'm better than Hillary Clinton. And as he said... Well, uh, Jonah Goldberg, I'm sorry. Jonah Goldberg uh, s said... Jeffrey Goldberg's messed up. Jeffrey Goldberg's the editor of The Atlantic, great podcast, The Atlantic Interview, and that's where uh, I heard Jonah Goldberg say this. His mandate was two things. It was conservative appointments to the Supreme Court. Don't be Hillary Clinton. Well, if your only standard for voting for a candidate is that you think he's one notch above the person who will destroy the country, that's not a great standard for us to have in political candidates. He's 100% right, but that's where we're at with Donald Trump. Like, I read What Happened by Hillary Clinton this weekend. You cannot believe how awful that book is. Okay, it's as bad as you have imagined it is. Uh, I, out of 475 pages, 
I've screenshotted and posted the photos of the only pages that are worth your time in the We Are Libertarians Facebook group, mm -hmm. and it's like 10. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, in the book, it's funny because she says, uh, you know, I carried around binders of people that I thought would be good for the transition, and I had the transition all staffed out, and I knew who I was going to pick. And then, like, two pages later... She loses the election, and they come and they say, what do you want to say? And she's like, I just didn't have anything to say. Honestly, the idea of losing had never crossed my mind. You know? <laughs> so she's yeah. buying this full of women. Um, right. Just, you know? Well, um, so I feel bad that you had to read that. Uh, what, do you, listen, want to, you want to borrow my uh, Scott Horton Fool's Aaron book? I will, actually, after when you're, after you're done with it. Okay, all right. Uh, it should be done next week. I'll yeah. bring it over. It's, yeah, it's a great palate cleanser from that. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, the, the Michael Wolf book has been the palate cleanser because it's 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 the Michael Wolf book has turned out to be great. It's turned out to be everything that I thought it would be. It's it's tawdry. It's gossipy. It's great. Uh, and you know, I still think that my my review last episode stands of it. Uh, but it is it is it is worth the read. And and in reality, the more you read on into it, you this is just him like kind of recapping all the news that came out in the New York Times and the Hill and Politico. Over the last year, yeah. I mean, it's it's not as sensational in the in the in the second half, but mm -hmm. it, it is a great read. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Sensational is calling like a country a crap hole. And... Right? Yeah. The, I mean, it's listen. Here's the reality that we're in. Okay, Donald Trump is not an insane person. Okay, but Donald Trump is the way you have to look at Donald Trump is Maggie Haberman so gloriously pointed out. Donald Trump is a person who went up into a tree house in the sky in 1983 and created a world in Trump Tower where he had con complete control over who he had access to. So he had been hanging out with Roy Cohn, who was the lawyer for uh, the, um, the McCarthy hearings and was this New York mob fixer, and he's hanging out with all these you know, mob bosses in the early 80s and then he ascends his golden staircase into his treehouse in Trump Tower. He rides an elevator to and from work, and he builds his own reality, and he surrounds himself with yes-men, and he isn't challenged in any way, shape, or form since 1983. Well, I'm, I was born in 1983, and that was 34 years ago. So here's a man who has built a cocoon around himself and then decided in 2016 to come out of it. And... You, you are seeing a man that is like Han Solo stuck in carbonite because he is stuck in 1983 and he is a New Yorker and he has 1983 thoughts. And what I, what I think is going on with Trump and why he's so offensive to us is that all of society progressed mm -hmm. pretty well, yeah. but Donald Trump didn't. <laughs> like Donald Trump just is stuck in 1983. And that's why he reminds you of your uncle. That's why he reminds me of uh, Tad, Western. A lot of good cars came out in 1983, though. A lot of good things came out in 1983. Yeah. Very handsome things. <laughs> but Donald Trump is somebody who has... He, he, do I think Donald Trump is a racist? No. no. Do I think Donald Trump is incredibly insensitive? Absolutely. Do I make insensitive jokes? Harry will attest... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The Omega left a wall chat. It's just crazy. <laughs> um, I took a photo with my friend Abdul Hakeem Shabazz yesterday. I posted it and it said, hanging out with my only black friend on Martin Luther King Day. Is that insensitive? Mom, absolutely it is. My left. Yes, but it's a joke. Mm -hmm. I'm being funny. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the, is it is it offensive to some? Probably. Do I care? No. <laughs> like, I just don't. Because... The idea that everybody and everything is racist, I'm done with it. Like, if, if, if I were a racist, I wouldn't treat Harry with such respect. I have named Harry Deputy Leader. De yes, Deputy Leader. Fist him when the coup comes. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Wait, what? No coup, there's no coup. Anyways, yeah, but everything is sexist, everything is racist, and you have to point that out. Exactly, because if I, if I say you're a racist, mm -hmm. I never have to deal with what you're saying. Right, yeah. yeah. I can completely... It is intellectually lazy and mm -hmm. weak. The amount of people who are truly racist in this country... Yeah. And le how would you define racism, Harry? To me, uh, I... See, that's, that's a hard question for me. I'm, okay, this is going, 
I, I, derail, I don't want to derail, but here we go. Uh, to me, I think if the whole world is racist, your brain, human brains are lazy. We make uh, assumptions. Every person on this gigantic rock is racist. Mm. You don't mean to be, but you are. You're also sexist. Surprise, your brain makes assumptions. The moment you see something, you pull up a quick database in your head of, a, of an assumption, and then you start breaking it down to subcultures what you've got, and then you start putting in your moral filter. It's what your brain does. Right. Sorry. But to me, a racist person, you know, to me, so like everybody's racist, but to me, to me that beyond racist person, more people who act on it and, you know, show out on it. That's to me, that's like, wow, that's super racist. Yeah, their, their, their thoughts, their actions, their behaviors, their relationships, these are things that are governed by the ideal that other people, based on their skin color, based on their biology, are inferior to them. Correct, yeah. That you are inferior, that, uh, Especially like some of the, like the race realist online, they are some of the worst people. Mm -hmm. they, they, one thing they like to bring out is the, explain race realist. I don't know what that means. Uh, race realists are people who believe that uh, race is real and that there's massive differences in race. And the more thing they like to say is IQ differences, mm -hmm. and they like to say that the people who have of African descent have smaller brain, uh, have smaller brains and have a lower IQ. What they do is they basically, the, the Richard Spencer's of the world, who mm -hmm. I do believe is a racist, because Richard Spencer takes tangential studies and facts and figures and then tries to paint a picture of an entire group of people yeah. as inferior because African Americans or blacks commit more crimes. So therefore, they are more predisposed to criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, that is completely removing the reality of the environment set up by government policy Correct. that most blacks in this country are operating within. Correct. And if you go back and you look at the racist policies of Richard Nixon and Haldeman and Ehrlichman, who flat out told, I think it was the Rolling Stone in the early 90s, we wanted to end the protests uh, against Richard Nixon so he could get reelected, and so we did two things. We, we couldn't outright criminalize being black and we couldn't criminalize being Democrats. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, so what did we do? We, we criminalized pot. We started the war on drugs. Right. And that destroyed the hippies and that destroyed the blacks. Mm -hmm. And they succeeded. Correct. Those are racist policies mm -hmm. because they're targeting an entire group of people based on political means, based on racial notions. And then 40 years later to look at it and go, huh, blacks just must be dumber. That's why they commit more crimes, because they can't control their urges. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No. <laughs> they can't control their urges. Like, uh, totally dis disregarding most of the economics of the situation. Or the, but the thing is, like, when you look at their graph, like, the thing is, what their graphs show, or what they're, like, they show, they show what they show. Okay? They don't do anything else. You can't, re you can't look at this and make all these assumptions. If that's not how science works, you can't do that. You're jumping. That's, ju that's a gigantic jump to conclusions. You're like, ha, ah, this is here, but it's just like, well, the thing is, I, um, I can, I, I don't want to attack your evidence, but, you know, I, what's your sample size? Um, what's the test like? Then it's like, well, how does this test ch change over time? And they try to show it. But then, the, and then they, like, when the IQ test is like, well, okay, most of these IQ tests are based off of uh, people in the military. Can I get an IQ test back to the actual criminals in the jail cell? I want, right. I want the IQ test of a lot of the kingpin blacks in the prisons. I want their IQ test. Yeah. Uh, because to me, they're going to be the high ones. Once we get to Haiti, and, and I, I've had, right. listen, I've had conversations with alt-right people about Haiti specifically, mm -hmm. and they, they just flat out say Haiti is a poor country because it's run by blacks. Right. That's yeah. a racist notion. Like, mm -hmm. yes. it, it, it isn't because they're black, it's because the American and the French imperial governments, mainly the French, mainly the French yeah. crippled them, which we will we'll explain why Haiti is a shithole in a moment, and you mm -hmm. won't believe it. Actually, you'll believe it. This audience will yeah. believe it. Yeah, it's yeah. This it, is the, it, Haiti and the largest parts of Africa. It's because a lot of the, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Listen, oh, wait, wait, racist back, wait, second, racist second. people are fucking stupid people. Okay, talk to a racist. This is why I cannot stand the destruction of social media by Facebook, by Twitter, by YouTube, and Google. They're destroying social media for leftist tendencies mm -hmm. instead of letting racists on their platform have a, a, a prominent position. Every person should, when they open up their Facebook page or their Twitter, the first thing they should see is a Richard Spencer tweet. Because they will realize how fucking stupid this person is. Right. He sounds intelligent, he feels intelligent, but he's actually a very dumb person manipulating history, manipulating data, 
-hmm. for uh, an opportunistic point to get a bunch of dumb people to follow him mm -hmm. because he wants to be rich mm -hmm. and he wants to make money. Right. And so he, he has decided, like David Duke before him, that if I just say things that sound right to these dumb hillbillies, then they will give me money. And guess what they do? Yeah. And oh, yeah. if you actually meet one of the people that support one of these guys, you will not be afraid of racists anymore because you will realize they don't understand history, they don't understand politics, they don't understand human nature. Oh, okay. They don't understand anything other than the stupid emotions in their tiny-sized lizard brains. Mm -hmm. They're dumb. Meet a Nazi, you will no longer be afraid of Nazis. Right. Yeah. Uh, when you hear him talk in debate, he debates like a leftist. He tries to... Because he is a leftist. He's a big, steaming leftist. Right. He, uses, he calls himself right just to get into like those right camps to get a after this. He, if you came in there as a you know Democrat socialist, you you know most you know people will be more apt to listen to his speech in the South. Will not listen to him because he's more of a left. Right. And even like I said, like even in his like you know, when you listen to his four, that four hour stream he had with a on Andy Worski live, you know he talked about his white ethno state and how he wanted to make the, that that white ethno state and it basically had uh, that tyrannical dictatorial powers on through it and have like classes in it but he wanted to be on top and he would not want to be a serf on the bottom of it. I'm going he talked about it. He openly like I do not you know, I will not be a serf in that system. Uh, I tried to watch that mm -hmm. at work yeah. without headphones on mm -hmm. and then about an hour in I was like what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> like uh, I'm also going to put up on our YouTube channel a second copy of the show and I'm just going to title it Richard Spencer is an idiot and I want you to go watch the comments. Watch the comments, because these are the people that you're afraid of. These are people who are absolute idiots. Mm -hmm. And people who work at these big tech companies are ruining their business and making people who have built their career on social media, people like me, go, mm, I'm out. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to other channels, because you, you've broken your promise to me too many times. You've restricted my speech, when my speech is perfectly valid and reasonable, to try and silence people who are a small percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. And and it's ridiculous. And so I don't want to do business with you anymore. Are we going to still continue to post on Facebook? Absolutely. But do I is it the the center of my strategy going forward? Absolutely not. Yeah. Like it just it's it's garbage. Yeah. Like they they are a garbage platform. They've broken their promise and we'll talk more about it in the future. But let's let's yeah. get go ahead. And everything they do like the whole Facebook platform is broken anyway. I, I, like, how many of you guys really do get, like, when you get the Facebook Live notification, the Patreon, how, do you guys actually get these Facebook Live notifications that we've gone live? You guys get right. that? Yeah. Or is it buried on the other crap? Or did it, or Facebook decide not to show it to you? Because yeah. we're libertarians. Correct, yeah. Right. Or, and, you know, and even the chat feed's freaking broken. Like, it, it's frozen, like, several different times we've been trying to read the chat, and I have to keep closing it down. Really listen, well, you know. go, go watch, uh, listen, Project Veritas has its problems. James O'Keefe has his problems. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a journalist. Selective editing. I think it's selective of editing, but I think this Twitter video that he found is worth your views. I will put it in the show notes. Uh, and yeah, it, it's uh, listen, this these social media companies are really screwing up their business. They're, they're, they deserve to die. Because if you're going to limit free speech, then you deserve to die. You don't deserve to have my business. Mm -hmm. And there are, big, there are going to be big pockets creating pro-freedom platforms coming soon, and people like us are going to go to those platforms. Yep. It's the, one of the uh, reasons, um, other than I'm thinking like Free Talk Live watches us and wants to mimic us, is that they <laughs> went to uh, Twitch is because YouTube shut it down too many times. Right. Yeah. YouTube shut it down. Facebook wouldn't let them show the broadcast, and you know, but you know, Twitch like we don't care. Give, you know. Listen, I love Free Talk Live. Ian, Ian is one of the few. Ian Freeman of Free Talk Live is one of the few black and yellows that has treated me with respect mm -hmm. and treated me with dignity, mm -hmm. and I think that. He has he has done so much to help we are libertarians, and you should listen to Free Talk Live. You should support those guys, and uh, he he's a good dude. And I thank him for airing us on on LRN FM. Mm -hmm. And I know that we and our audience generally don't get along with anarcho anarcho capitalists or anarchists. Uh, what we affectionately refer to as black and yellows or liberty larpers. Mm -hmm. But Ian has always been a stand-up guy to me, and uh, I will always, uh, I won't say always, but I will do my best to always support Ian in return because he's been good to me. Uh, yeah. So, 
Uh, what happened? What's, what, are the, what is the context of the shithole comment? So the Washington Post put out yesterday evening uh, a, a detailed account of what happened. So uh, this is called Inside the Tense Profane White House Meeting on Immigration by Josh Dawsey, Robert Costa, and Ashley Parker. When President Trump spoke by phone with Dick Durbin, Senator Richard Durbin of Illinois, around 10.15 a.m. last Thursday, he expressed pleasure with Durbin's outline of a bipartisan immigration pact and praised the high-ranking Illinois Democrat, according to White House officials and congressional aides. The president then asked Lindsey Graham, his one-time foe-turned-ally, if he was on board, and Durbin affirmed. Trump invited the lawmakers to visit with him at noon, the people familiar with the call set. So they were meeting after this show immigration uh, event. But when they arrived at the Oval Office, the two senators were surprised to find that Trump was far from ready to finalize the agreement. He was, quote, fired up and surrounded by hardline conservatives such as Senator Tom Cotton, who seemed to be confident that the president was now aligned with them, according to one person with knowledge of the meeting. Now listen. Dick Durbin is garbage, Senator Lindsey Graham is garbage, Tom Cotton is garbage, and so is Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, so these are garbage people. Uh, and, uh, you know, Lindsey Graham has been called Gramnesty. If immigration is important to you, if you, want, if you agree with Donald Trump on immigration, you're going to agree with Tom Cotton on immigration and not with Lindsey Graham or Dick Durbin. Now... Uh, excuse me. Now, what, what, you were, what you were getting is a confirmation of what Michael Wolff frequently talks about in Fire and Fury. This entire episode validates what this book was talking about. Because in response to the book, Donald Trump holds this 50-minute meeting, which you can go and watch on YouTube, I'll put it in the show notes, this 50-minute meeting with high-ranking Democrats and Republicans from both chambers of Congress. And it is an effort for him to look presidential and stable and a deal-maker and in control. And it kind of worked for a day and a half. And so uh, Donald Trump in this meeting continually is flattering people and I'm going to make a deal, I'm going to do what it takes. And he considerably disturbs many conservatives with this meeting because... It was hilarious to go and listen to talk radio at the end of last week as they're all going, uh, I don't know, can we not trust Donald Trump? Mike Cernovich, this is the one thing that will erode his base. This is the one thing that will get people to flee. Uh, is Donald Trump going to, like, roll over? I mean, is he going to give him... Let me be clear. Donald Trump wants to win. Donald Trump has no ideology. And so when the Republicans lose the House... And if the Republicans lose the Senate in 2018, everything goes to gridlock. His window of getting anything accomplished, period, mm -hmm. but definitely in this first turn is over. Like he he has just he has the rest of 2018 to get anything done. Because mm -hmm. once the that chambers flip, and I do think they're going to flip because you see a record number of existing members of the party in power retiring. And you see a lot of these guys retiring because they're term limited from their chairmanship. I think it's three terms, consecutive terms, as the chairman of a committee. This is these are Republican Party rules. They've they've set term limits. So if you like a guy like Daryl Issa, mm -hmm. term limits are the reason he's leaving because he's no longer allowed to be that that chairman. These guys still could remain in the House, mm -hmm. but they they can't maintain that chairmanship. Right. And so there's I think it's like thirty at this point of them are retiring. Why? I think they've all seen polling that shows this is going to be a bloodbath and they don't want to go out losing. And so they are going to just go out gracefully and let the next idiot lose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and ISIS specifically, he got redistricted and it's a much tougher district and he barely won last time and so he doesn't want to lose. And they don't want to have to defend Donald Trump anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the, the House is going Democrat. Nancy Pelosi... I can't imagine she'll be speaker again because she's she's definitely senile. Like there's no doubt about it. Like Nancy Pelosi's losing it. And she's losing the center of power in her party. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And Nancy Pelosi is um going to be her speaker if 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 they can't come to a new consensus candidate. And so <laughs> and so uh it, uh you know 
I know we all say, not that Ron, Paul Ryan's any better, but he is. He's way better than Nancy Pelosi. Like, a big government, socialist, I want to invade other countries, everything is racial politics Democrat, doesn't have anything in common with libertarians at all. Like, at least Paul Ryan's tax cuts, we can go, okay, I can get on board with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the only thing we're on board with, you want to help people, cool, right. but... Yeah, right. Like, I just have nothing in common yeah. philosophically with Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. I don't even think she's a good person. So, <laughs> and so, when that happens, Donald Trump is going to, in an effort to get reelected, start to look like a deal maker. So the guy who was a Democrat six months ago is going to start cutting deals. So if you're a Republican, <laughs> you're not really going to like the Donald Trump of his second half of his first term. Because that dude's just going to sell you up the river if you're a conservative. Like, libertarians, we just don't care. Like, that's the beautiful part about being a libertarian. That we're going to get effed no matter what yeah. from the Republicans and the Democrats. And we just go, ha I told you so. This is why you should be a libertarian. But he's going to cut deals. And he showed that willingness in this meeting. And he showed in this meeting his complete lack of understanding of the entire process. He showed that he doesn't really have a grasp of the core issue that he ran on, which was immigration. And he's willing to win at the expense of what he was vo voted in for. He, you know, For all the talk about, oh, he does this for his base. Like in that meeting, he wasn't sticking up for his base. You know, uh, the head of the Freedom Caucus basically had to s stand up and go, uh, hey, um, you didn't mean that. <laughs> Mark Meadows was like, no. Was it Mark Meadows or Kevin McCarthy, one of the, the, the House Whip or the Freedom Caucus, no, you don't, you, you, don't, you don't mean clean bill. You mean this is what you mean. And he's like, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's what I meant. Like, so Donald Trump has basically in the last few days, since the Michael Wolff book, verified the Michael Wolff book by having a meeting, talking over everyone, not listening to anyone, flattering everybody, agreeing with everybody, and then when they don't do what he wants, throwing a tantrum and calling them fake news. And then this, if this is, the report is to be believed, and I have no doubt that it's true, yeah. Uh, there's nothing here that I, I tend to believe the Washington Post and the New York Times most of the time, like about stuff like this. Uh, the New York Times, you can't you can't believe those. Guys. Right. Well, here's the thing: there are certain things like we talked last time about James Risen and mm -hmm. his new book, where the New York Times is in the bag for big government. Yeah. But when it comes to reporting the gossip that people are telling them, they're probably accurate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're because yeah, gossip makes money. Exactly right. They're big government shills, so you mm -hmm. you can't believe them on that. On like the stuff that you get at the Intercept. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to is Donald Trump full of shit, they have the story. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and so, so one of the things Wolf says is that the last person to Donald Trump is the person who Donald Trump agrees with. And so there was a race between Priebus, Bannon, and Kushner to consistently be the last person to talk to Donald Trump or in a meeting at the end of the day. because the, Or they would call, the, he sits in bed and makes phone calls to people and, and self-pities, and so they would start strategically lining up people to call Donald at night and reaffirm their position. Okay, so... <laughs> Donald Trump talks to Dick Durbin and says, I'm totally on board. We've got a deal. You're going to give me funding for the wall. Uh, I'm going to give you DACA. Great. Give me, give me, give me. Then he goes in, and Tom Cotton's sitting there with his little snake double fork tongue. And who is... It's a race between Lindsey Graham and Tom Cotton for the worst senator. Uh, race to the bottom. Yeah, like, Tom Cotton's pretty pretty close uh like at least lindsey graham's funny <laughs> like, sometimes i see lindsey graham and i'm like oh he's a shit poster mm -hmm. uh, i can respect that but so they come in and now he agrees with tom cotton and not dick durbin so he's flip-flopped so dick durbin gets pissed and leaks the shit hole comment so that's that's where we're, we're at in the story trump told the the group he wasn't interested in the terms of the deal anymore um, he, after, as he shrugged off suggestions from Durbin and others, the president called the nations from Africa, Africa shithole countries, denigrated Haiti, and grew angry. The meeting was short, tense, and often dominated by loud crosstalk and swearing, according to Republicans and Democrats familiar with the meeting. Trump's ping-ponging from deal-making to feuding, from elation to fury, has come to define the contentious immigration talks, 
between the White House and Congress, perplexing members of both parties as they navigate the president's vulgarities, his combativeness, and is willing to suddenly change his position. All verifying exactly what's in the Fire and Fury book, by the way. The blow-up has derailed these negotiations yet again and increased the possibility of a government shutdown over the fate of hundreds of thousands of young undocumented immigrants known as Dreamers. This account of the events surrounding Thursday's explosive meeting is based on interviews with more than a dozen White House officials, Capitol Hill aides, and lawmakers. The fight has left congressional leaders unsure of whether they will eventually come to an agreement. Some remain optimistic that Trump can be walked back to the political center and will cut a deal that expands border security while protecting those under DACA and which Trump has ordered ended. The president is indispensable to getting a deal, Graham said. Time will tell. So... Trump basically objected that there wasn't enough money for the wall, and uh, I thought Mexico was paying for it, by the way. Uh, he objected that Democratic proposals adjust the visa lottery and federal policy for immigrants with temporary protected status were going to drive more people from countries he deemed undesirable to the U.S. instead of attracting immigrants from pl places like Norway and Asia, people familiar with the meeting said. So if Trump were racist, he wouldn't want Asians here. <laughs> right? Like, if Trump had a problem... Like, I, I like, we'll, we'll get to it, but I just wanted to point that out. Uh, attendees who were alarmed by racial undertones of Trump's remarks were further disturbed when the topic of the Congressional Black Caucus came up. At one point, Durbin told the president that members of the caucus would be more likely to agree a deal if certain countries were included in the, in the protections. Trump was curt and dismissive, saying he was not making policy, immigration policy to cater to the CBC and did not particularly care about that bloc's demands, according to people briefed on the meeting. You've got to be joking, one advisor said, describing Trump's reaction. Um, John Kelly, the White House Chief of Staff, was in the room and was largely stone-faced, not giving any vis visible reaction when Trump said shithole countries or when he said Haitians should not be part of any deal. At one point, Graham told Trump he should use different language to discuss immigration people briefed on the meeting said. So, Dur so Lindsey Graham said, uh, Mr. President, please stop. Uh, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so he, he basically, uh, Bob Goodlatte from Virginia, told Graham and Durbin that they needed to be more conservative. Durbin was not interested. Graham left, and he told associates that he was disturbed by what he heard in the Oval Office, according to people who spoke with him and that it was evident the deal's antagonist had gotten to Trump. Graham and Durbin told allies that they were stunned that the other lawmakers were present and that Trump's tone seemed so different than it had been days or even hours before, according to people close to him. Uh, Graham declined to verify that. Uh, there had been hope initially. Trump told lawmakers during a partially, partially televised session that he was flexible and he'll sign whatever the congressional people put in front of him. Now, Mr. President... You weren't elected to trust these people. <laughs> you weren't elected to sign whatever these people, who are good people. Oh, all of them are great people, I know all of them. Which is what he said in the meeting. You weren't elected to, to sign whatever they put in front of you. <laughs> you weren't elected to do whatever Tom Cotton tells you to do. Mm -hmm. You weren't elected to do what Lindsey Graham said to do. So, I think there's going to be a real cost to Donald Trump if he... I mean, this is embarrassing for him. Like, this is exactly... We know who he is, and this is exactly who he is, but uh, this is... Whew! <laughs> him basically saying... And that's what the conservative talk show hosts were all upset about. Like, this guy is going to do whatever they say. He'll sign whatever they want. These are the people that we elected for you to punish. Right, yeah. Not to, to deal-make with. Yeah, we want you to go after them. Uh, so... Basically, all of, people like Stephen Miller, uh, who's his conservative advisor, former roommate with Richard Spencer at Duke, as uh, we've pointed out on the show in the past, and, and Stephen Miller was the uh, worked for for uh, tiny little Jeff Sessions, and Jeff Sessions was an Alabama senator who was very anti-immigration, like a closed border guy, and Stephen Miller was very instrumental in all those policies that Jeff Sessions uh, basically preached about. And, you know, the guy knows his stuff, and that's why he's still in the White House. He's still central to the immigration stuff. And he's definitely chirping in Trump's ear about all this. 
So basically, Stephen Miller finds out that he's cutting a deal with the liberals, and he calls Kevin McCarthy, the House Majority Leader, and he said uh, Senator David Perdue and Tom Cotton were also invited to rush over, so they came over to fix him. <laughs> and Mark, uh, he's been talking to Mark Meadows, head of the Freedom Caucus, a lot. And in the late morning, Durbin and Graham arrived. Kelly, who had already been briefed on the deal, talked to Trump to tell him the proposal would probably not be good for his agenda. Now, Kelly is the former Secretary of Homeland Security, and he is a true believer on the immigration stuff. He believes what Trump and Stephen Miller believe on immigration, and he's the gatekeeper for Trump, and he's basically the one who really pushed Trump to rethink a lot of this, according to this article. And uh, after the Thursday meeting, Trump began telling allies the proposal was a terrible deal for me, according to a friend he spoke with. And it wasn't a serious proposal. It's not viewed as a serious proposal because it did so little to address immigration issues that the president has been vocal about, Meadows said. If it was, if I had to put it in a 1 to 10 range, with 10 being the most conservative and 1 being the most liberal, I would give it a 2.5. So he wasn't particularly upset about the coverage of the meeting and his vulgarity after it was reported by the Post, calling friends and asking how they expected it to play, and everyone was saying it would help with his base. Which I said, too, and I agree with. I think it's part of the disconnect. It's You have the people like Dan Rather and these liberal media members shocked and horrified that Donald Trump would think Haiti is a shithole. Have you ever met a person that watches Duck Dynasty? Yeah. Or watches NASCAR? Or... Left DC? That, that has to take a shower after work and not before? Mm -hmm. Because those are the people who agree. Like, yeah, Haiti's a shithole. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is kind of a shithole country, and we'll explain why. But 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 also in the, in the same thing. Yeah, but to someone like me, New York City is pretty kind of a shithole. Honestly, you know, New Jersey, the entire state of New Jersey. Hanging out with Nancy Pelosi is a shithole. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Gary. Okay, right. Uh, Parts so of Plainfield. now in this in the Fire and Fury book, Kushner and Ivanka Trump are 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 liberal Republicans. Like, Jared Kushner was a, a Democrat until this. Jared Kushner's role is really to, like, wrangle all the billionaires from New York City, and uh, he's a very liberal person, and so he's really pushing Trump to be liked by people like Lindsey Graham and uh, Dick Durbin. And then there's the Tom Cottons and the and the John Kellys of the world who are saying, no, nah, keep, your, keep your focus on what you actually ran on. So, I think... This is a really, um, I think there's a battle for the soul of the White House. I think now that Bannon and Priebus are gone, you've got, um, you've got Kushner really pushing a lot more of the, what Alex Jones would call the globalist agenda, what Hannity would call the leftist agenda. Uh, if you, if you're a, a conservative, you are anti-Jared Kushner, he's not on your tribe. And uh, you are pro Tom Cotton. If you're if you're more of a liberal person, then you are rooting for Dick Durbin and Lindsey Graham. And like I think, the the way it comes down for me in terms of the immigration stuff, like I think it's absolutely crazy that there would ever be a question that we were. Wh why would we want the DACA? Kid, why would we want these people to go back? Correct. Like yeah. I saw I saw a guy who was from Mexico. He's 39. He's been here for 30 years, mm -hmm. but he was too old. He didn't make the DACA cutoff. He got shipped back to Mexico. His wife and three kids are still here. They're teenagers, mm -hmm. you know. And so now he's back in Mexico in a in a place where he has he has no connection to that land. Right. And he's a he's a rational actor with no criminal record who is producing value to our economy. Like, mm -hmm. why would we not want that person to stay here indefinitely? Exactly. Yeah. You know the DACA kids, the so-called 800,000 DACA kids, produce billions of dollars of revenue mm -hmm. in taxes and doing work jobs. and doing and workforce revenue. Yep, and they're in, a lot of them are college educated. They're, they're, these aren't like a lot of more college tomato educated. picking Mexicans. Yep. Like these DACA kids are kids who are yep. Ivy League educated, mm -hmm. and you know it, because that was part of the program. You right. had to go to college, right? And so you have very like. The 200,000 uh, El Salvadorans, I think it is. The Haitians, like... Isn't some of them also, also serving, too? Or some of, like, mm -hmm. some of them are serving in the mili active military. Right yeah. Now. So, I, 
I, I just don't see why we would want to ship back people who have great economic value. I get why you want to send back the MS-13. Yeah, why you want? Sense. Why you like? Now here's the thing about MS-13 in El Salvador. It is absolutely on fire. Guatemala is on fire, and it's because you you had these people who came here illegally. And they were arrested on minor drug charges, sent to prison. They weren't sent back to their countries mm -hmm. during the Clinton administration. And they get thrown into the gang culture of the L.A. prisons. And so they have to form gangs to protect themselves. Thus, MS-13 was created. They get out of prison. They get shipped back to their countries. The, the gangs basically ch take over the countries. These formerly fairly peaceful agrarian societies now are turned into narco states, mm -hmm. and they have become a thorn in the United States side. And it's all because of the American drug war on drugs. Right. And so it's, it's just, it's like, do, when are we going to get it? <laughs> like, when are we going to look at our own policy and go, hmm, we should start doing some things differently around here? Like, we just don't, and, and, and the Republicans are so short-sighted, the, the, well, we gotta send all them back. It's like, Jeff Sessions, mm -hmm. you, you push for the, the, the change in Alabama to get rid of labor that was illegally, the undocumented workers, essentially. Yep. And your entire economy collapsed mm -hmm. in 2010, I believe it was. Yep. Because no one was picking tomatoes. Yep. They had to go and get parolees. <laughs> And had them like, hey, you got to pick these vegetables or you're going back to jail. They spent, what, it was like, I think it was like half a day up there. And I was like, I'll take jail. They, they literally, yeah. To jail. Yeah, and Vice did a great piece on it. And uh, they, you look it up, uh, I forget what the title was, but Vice did a piece on it back in 2010. And they were like, we, we, have, we have no one to work the fields and white people are too lazy because they just get welfare. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, and uh, yeah, the photos of like the fruit, just and not fruit, but like yeah, the vegetables just just dying, rotting, just dying, rotting, yeah. rotting, yeah. rotting there in the field because you can't pick them, can't right. get them, you can't get them, and it's that, and it was, it was also like neat around, also around that time it was the flood of the in other states of people like, you know, when you started meeting all these like you know, uh, quote unquote people, you know, illegals, whatever, whatever, just humans. Right. Uh, from Alabama. I've started meeting all these people from Alabama, and I was like, where are you guys all coming? Why are you guys all coming from Alabama? And I was like, oh, it's this. And I was like, what? It's crazy. And But they were some of the hardest workers, especially when we put them in the warehouse, and like, let me get this straight. I can work, you know, because I was working in electronic recycling and had them do all this work. It's like, you're telling me I can used to work inside of a building that has right. a fan? <laughs> yeah. And not the Alabama heat. Right, yeah, August. I get I, I, I get a fan. What do I have to do? Well, you just got to tear it out. You know, we only need this amount of people. So many white people are doing it. And the next thing I know, <laughs> done. Drew, done, done. <laughs> Give me some next ones. It's like, what the, what are they doing? Just, just blowing, blowing through. It's like, oh, oh, because wow. they don't want to go back to their shithole countries. Right. And listen, if you defend your country and say it's not a shithole, can we stop sending you government aid? The other thing is, like, um, if your country's large enough, you're going to have a shithole. Because right. it's just like I think the only place that doesn't have have one is Connecticut and Rhode Island because it's so small. The entire state of Massachusetts is um, is a shithole. They actually have a hole. It's called the Big Dig. Okay, <laughs> a little literal hole, literally a hole in it. Um, uh, Bittner went there to try to plug it up. He was going to try his best, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, as we said uh, on previ previous episodes, you want this cheap labor coming in and working and then paying taxes, mm -hmm. and that's why there needs to be. A systematic set of visas for people coming in here to work. We don't want them to pay taxes. We no one wants to pay taxes. I mean, if we, I have taxes. to pay taxes, they, they should take too. taxes. You don't pay taxes. They take taxes. Right. We take taxes. Listen, if I gotta pay it, they gotta pay it. Yeah. That, yeah. All right. Oh, so you're want... like if we all get robbed from, we all get robbed from. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> maybe I'll get robbed a little less. I remember that next time someone asked for your wallet, like, get his wallet too. Dude. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I like honestly. So, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I feel you. Are it that. doesn't and mean that we have to give them voting rights. It doesn't mean that we have to give immigrants the ability to vote in our not? system. Why not? Because it is. Why should we? Why shouldn't we? Do you want like? Here's the thing about the 
Norwegians that Donald Trump once added to our roles. Yeah. These are people who love socialism. Yeah. I don't want them having... That's a very scary thought. I don't want them having voting rights. I only want libertarians having voting rights, damn it. (laughs) Okay? Like... Or you want want to go... How about we roll it back to maximum freedom land of 1776 and only white landowners (laughs) can vote? How about that? I, I, I believe... That I'm, I'm not, an, I'm not fully open borders, but I think closed borders is idiotic. It's bad economics. People go where freedom is, mm-hmm. and you don't want to limit migration for economic opportunities. And if people spend a certain period of time and contribute to the society, then yes, they should be allowed to have voting rights. But coming here and getting voting rights within a, a year and then going on welfare, I'm not for that. Like I, I don't believe in in, in paying for more people who don't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I, yeah, and I get that. And the other thing is, I also, uh, but I also see the need to be like, well, if you're here, you're paying into the system, then you should, my, all, you should, you should also, I think if you're here inside the quote-unquote border of the United States, every right if it, uh, afforded to anyone inside, you know, these rights of the Constitution, you should be able to, you should have every right as such. Uh, you have the right to freedom of speech, arm yourself, you know, all those. You get all these. Here you go. I, listen, I have And it's a, not that the government's given it to you. It's just more of the government recognizes you have this as a human being. Sure. I, uh, I, I'm fairly, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, I generally think that you have to write the full name of the person that you should vote for, that you want to vote for, and if you misspell, your vote doesn't count. Um, like... I'm for that, and the, <laughs> and you have to put the party, you not the party, but the, the, the office that they're running for. Right. Uh, I, I don't believe in make I don't believe in pure democracy. I believe in representative government. I, I believe that as many people should have the right to vote as possible, but you have to be a good citizen to vote. You know, like I, I think <laughs> there are a lot of really shitty citizens who go and vote on all sides, mm-hmm. including in the libertarian movement and who don't know who they're voting for. We've all cast that ballot for that judge that we didn't know. And we don't take voting seriously, so adding to the voting rolls of people who don't understand our values as Americans fully, then I don't believe that they should have the right to vote and full citizenship. Okay. Now, after a period of time, and they have shown the ability to understand what American exceptionalism is, mm-hmm. then, yes, join the club. Let's table that conversation next the next election. It'd be a great thing to talk on election night. Yeah. This is so, awesome. I'll table that. So, this is awesome. So let's go to the show. But, let's but, but the other thing I want to up. say is the uh, I also think this is the need for many people to come into the United States because that's the only thing that will shoot up the Ponzi scheme of Social Security is more people. Sure, it's a Ponzi scheme. Awesome, we need more people. That's what I'm saying. Like work visas for these people who want to come here and want to work and want to raise their family. Yeah. Good. Why are we sending this guy from Mexico who's 39 and has spent his entire adult life giving to our society? Like, that's a man that deserves to be here. What if you could, like, uh, like loan out your citizenship so, like, an American could sit on the beach and do nothing but sponsor someone to come over here? They pay for everything for him, and you just like, no, no, you work for me. You know. That's basically what happened in Haiti, which we'll get to here in a moment. Uh, so let's let's finish up with the, the shithole comment. And here's what you have to understand about uh, Donald Trump. I mentioned American exceptionalism because I am an American exceptionalist. I believe that the values of America make us exceptional as a nation. Those values are individualism, individual rights, limited government, free markets and capitalism, the a value on the virtue of production, uh, the I value peace. These are, these are libertarian values represented in our founding that, are, that made America exceptional because it made us a, a, a pro-liberty, pro-free market, pro-peace nation. And it was the first time where there was an, erase, uh, an erasure of the class system. You didn't have people lording over others, except for that whole slavery thing. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took it took until Martin Luther King for people to have like in 1960 there were six is it six million blacks in s- the South? It was around there, yeah. And it wasn't until 1964 that you had two million registered in 1964, and 800 thousand had been registered in 1963. Mm-hmm. There were entire counties, entire states in the South where no black voted. 
That's not freedom. That's 50 years ago. Because it was dangerous. Because it was deadly. Mm -hmm. It was as deadly as drinking Flint water. Yeah, yeah, you could get, you know, you could die. So all these people who say, oh, well, we are so, we've just, there's, we are losing our freedoms left and right. Dude, you've never had more freedom in the history of the world than you do right now. This podcast is devoted to picking on the leaders of this country, and nobody says boo. In fact, government leaders want to, government officials want to come on this network. Yeah. You know, Mike Pence's brother may be on Boss Hog of Liberty. Nice. Like, that's freedom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to participate in the discussion. Mm -hmm. So, black people can vote. Harry is allowed to speak his voice without walking out of this door and having a mob of white people kill him. Or just having a white wife. And you have a white wife. White wife and an interracial child. Yeah, yeah. congratulations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you, you really have, you've achieved Martin's dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I was back in 1960, I up a tree. Yeah, up Literally, a tree. Yeah. Up a tree. Up a tree. Uh, so we have, we are losing economic freedom because of things like inflation and the Federal Reserve stealing our money and increased taxation. But we have the chance to actually change that stuff because we can write laws and change it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like the, one of the people who were talking about that school system uh, argument earlier, he said, well, that's not true about school choice because X, Y, and Z doesn't happen in the bills that have been written. And I said, so write the bill that you like and mm -hmm. then go rally people around it. And politicians only act on their incentives to get reelected and maintain power. Mm -hmm. Grow a cause and a movement large enough to intimidate those people into doing what you want and you'll get more freedom by rolling back old laws or introducing new systems mm -hmm. of government. That's what we as Americans have the ability to do. You you look at Elizabeth Warren. There is somebody who was sitting in a room, thought up a, a new bureau for the government, got to know her congressman, mm -hmm. and then next thing you know, she's senator and talking, running for president, and this isn't like when it's been a span of 15 years. Mm -hmm. You can do that, listener. Yep. You have the ability to do that. That's what makes America exceptional. You don't have to have the right amount of money. You don't have to have the right pedigree. You don't have to have X, Y, and Z. You, if you work hard enough, can achieve these certain things. We still have that in this country. And that's one of the things that makes us exceptional, and those are the things that we have to protect. The folk intellectuals in this country want you to have that pedigree, that dynasty. Right. They want that. That's what they want. People spin myths to gaslight you and demotivate you from thinking that you have the ability to do any of this. Right, yeah. That's why they like the Clintons. That's why they Thanks. want want Chelsea and uh, Sasha to run. They're like, oh, this would be great. We could Sasha and Melina. Plenty of black and, and yellows who are... Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Donald Trump's view of American exceptionalism is that America is great because it has the most bombs, it has the most money, and it has white culture. And those of us who don't believe in that version of, of baby boomer Republican ex American exceptionalism mm -hmm. don't see that it, 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 it's, it's just that fundamental break that we have with him. Libertarians break with those Republicans, especially baby boomer conservatives, who have that view of American exceptionalism because their view of what makes America great does not match our view. Same with Democrats. You know, Nancy Pelosi sees America as a great country because she can appoint I don't I don't even know. I don't think I don't I just don't think a lot of Democrats think America is great or exceptional. Like I don't think Barack Obama believed that America was a great country. I think that, you know, he I don't know what he believed. I don't want to talk about him. I'm tired of him. Yeah. Gonna, <laughs> so so anyways, so when Donald Trump calls these countries a shithole, that's, what, that's where it's coming from. That we are superior to them because we have more bombs, more money, and white culture. And that's why it is inherently a racial statement. Uh, and that is, that is a racist temperament. That doesn't mean that the man is an outright racist. doesn't make him David Duke. There's 50 shades of gray to everything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's just like Martin Luther King. Was he a uh, was he a perfect human? No. Excuse me. I've got I've had like a sinus thing going on and uh, a cold, mm -hmm. and I didn't take my uh, nose candy, my nope. Sudafed before. Yeah, you're uh, you're 
the white powder stuff that's on your mirror in your bedroom, <laughs> the stuff that you got in there? Uh, no, that's just uh, for my humidifier, all cool. the impurities from the water. Because you don't use distilled. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, and it's, from all that discussion, and you can, I, I get that, you know, like, and it's, a lot of people will say that, you know, they, they get offended because they, like, well, the comment is also about some of the people that are there and stuff like that, and we'll get into the discussion on why that's there. Right. But a lot of things, like, when I was trying to talk to people about, like, um, the one thing about it, I was like, okay, so the, the comment about shithole people, like, shithole countries uh, uh, matter to you, but, you know, President Obama bombed a hospital, mm -hmm. that, you know, meh, meh, I'm going to work. Right. I'm going to work. I don't even care. No hashtag needed. Right. You know, but the thing is, the other thing is, like, Africa is so large, it's by default going to have a, what 1% shithole. Right. Let's say every continent has 1% of a shithole. Of course, I think Antarctica, 100% shithole. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, but, you know, there's so many deserts, so many, like, you can't live here. There's no life here. That place, to me, it's a shithole. Like, the, pre the, the president's saying it. Well, first off, we don't know that he said it because it was right. a leaked comment mm -hmm. by Dick Durbin who wanted to weaken the president's position and outgame the senators that he was competing against for the president's attention. And it really just sounded like an offhand like, comment. Like, well, I mean, you know. Why are we letting these shithole countries come here? Yeah. Like, it, it, and then he goes on and rails against the president's use of the term chain migration, mm -hmm. which is the term for it. Yeah. Watch the Democrats start hammering this. So chain migration is essentially, let's say Harry and I are brothers, mm -hmm. and Harry moves to, you know, I, we're, we're from England, and Harry moves to America. Mm -hmm. Well, I have the ability to migrate with my family, mm -hmm. my cousin, to move. So it's a chain of families, Correct. right? Yeah. It's a you chain of family members. Dick, Dick Durbin says it's inherently racist for the president to call it chain migration, which policy people have been calling it for years, forever, inherently racist because his constituents might get confused and think that Donald Trump is saying some people migrated here in chains. <laughs> this, is a, this is a senator. This is a man who is supposed to be intelligent. Current year. Take anything. We'll take any swing. There's so because they're tired of the winning, so they just gotta take any swing. They're just right. taking swings. Like this election season is gonna get, it's gonna get crazy. Yeah. The uh, attacks are gonna get crazy. It's 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 gonna be one hell of a year. It's gonna be one hell of a year. I I am anticipating it. It should be. I I want it to. I know the Democrats are gonna try to bring their A game, but I. I'm doubtful. Yeah. And I know that the Republicans, they they usually bring their A-game on the um, uh, on these, like, off-presidential election years. What, what do they call it? I can't remember the name of it. But midterms. Midterms. But uh, but I don't even think they're going to bring in their A. I think they're like, now we're going to sit at home for this yeah. one. We're going to sit this one off. So. This one, you know, this is, this year's, got, these two years, is got, it's a waste of money. So, as I've said, I work in major media. I work for a major radio show that is across the nation. And a show that's a comedy show that was greatly affected by Janet Jackson. And uh, a lot of their bits were canceled out because of Janet Jackson. And then imagine my surprise when every media outlet on the planet starts pinging me with a notification that says shithole, shithole, shithole. Well, what about the like 10-year-old kid who has CNN on his iPad because he's a little nerd like me and is just seeing shithole pop up? Like... It undermines every parent that tells their kid, don't say shit. Right. You know, because, well, Jim Acosta says it, why can't I? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it, it just, it blows my mind the depths to which the media will sink to try and undermine Donald Trump. They, they will, you know, President Obama called uh, in an interview during his presidency, uh, he called Benjamin Netanyahu chicken shit directly relatable to what Donald Trump did. And that was on the record in an interview. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a secondhand comment. And everybody was just outraged at Donald Trump, but nobody said anything about Barack Obama. Like, I, I mean... It's different. He, it, 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 it's different. It's different. It, 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 it really isn't. <laughs> no, yeah, it's not. Yeah, none of it's not. And, um, yeah, and it's... I'm just, no, go ahead. Bring, bring it over I'm just waiting for us to get into the like the why Haiti is the way it is because it's very. It is 
Haiti is a great story, especially with Black History Month coming up. Yeah. Well, we will. Let me let me play this because I just find the outrage over Donald Trump, his comments, mm-hmm. confusing because we know this is Donald Trump. We know who he is, and it doesn't give you license to just say shit all the like. CNN was worse than 2016. We are libertarians. <laughs> like it was, it was, it was a uh, dank fam. This is Cory Booker. This is a male senator uh, yelling at the uh, Homeland Security Secretary uh, Kirsten Nielsen. This is a male senator, a male senator, a Democrat, berating a female. Listen to the outrage, the passion in Cory Booker's voice. Do, do we believe for a second that Cory Booker had tears of rage, Harry? Tears. Tears of rage. I, I, I can believe that, yeah. The, that grown-ass man was crying that the president called Haiti a shithole? Or do you think that, like, any rational grown-up, he went, Oh, God. Whatever. And then went on about his life. The tears that he were crying of joy so that he had the ability to go out and grandstand and berate a woman, Harry. He mm-hmm. berated that woman. I can't wait to turn on Slate and Salon tomorrow and see all the think pieces about male senators demeaning female nominees and, and, using, and using their power to mansplain this woman. I don't think that's going to happen because she's a Republican and he's a Democrat. And he's brown. And he's brown and she's white. Okay, so I, I just, I think the reaction to all this has been so overblown. Like, roll your eyes with me. We know the extent of it. So, we know who Donald Trump is. So why is, shitty, why is Haiti a shill? Uh, Africa, a lot of this applies to. But Haiti is a shithole. Haiti mm-hmm. is a poor country. Mm-hmm. Haiti is uh, constantly being, uh, there was a, a UN shooting because they're trying to keep the peace mm-hmm. in, in Haiti right now. Mm-hmm. Haiti's not recovered from the, the, the uh, whatever. And, and make no mistake, like Donald Trump's saying that, why do we want these people from shithole countries? The people who are saying, oh, he said it about the countries, not the people. Give me a fucking break. Like, you don't believe that. You aren't that stupid. You aren't that... You aren't that logically unable to see that Donald Trump is saying people from Haiti are inferior. Yeah. Like, is it because they're black? I'm not going to put that thought in his head, but he clearly is saying these people are inferior. hmm Well, why is their country inferior? So this comes from Ohio State University. OSU.ed. Uh, edu. I will put this in the show notes. And it is called A Pact with the Devil, the United States and the Fate of Modern Haiti. Now, uh, Haiti Haiti and uh, the Dominican Republic share an island, mm-hmm. and uh, it was an early important place for France. At first it wasn't, but then it was. It, it, was, it was the Spanish discovered it and, and colonized it. And then the pirates kind of took, took it, it over. over. Sold their own, sold the beef back to back, right. to, back to England. <laughs> right, and then the French came and took it over mm-hmm. and took over the island. And the French, you know, the Louisiana Purchase mm-hmm. was a direct result of some of the slave trade in Haiti. So 
And so we pick it up in 1826, and uh, we're going to post a great video by John Green. And Mark, it, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in that time, too. Yeah, and there's a great video. We're not going to cover it here, but the, the Haitian Revolution was the direct result of us getting the Louisiana Purchase. And Haiti was the first, uh, the first nation in this hemisphere to declare slavery legal. Uh, the first black-led nation here in this hemisphere. I mean, it, it, the Haitian Revolution was really important to America's future. Uh, we just don't have time to cover it, so that we're going to put that great YouTube video up at WAL Politics and then also in the show notes. Uh, so check that out. It's really, really good. Um, but we pick it up in 1826. Uh, Southern antagonism towards Haiti erupted on the floors of Congress when John Quincy Adams proposed that we should participate in a conference of independent American nations at which Haiti might also be represented. In response, Southern congressional leaders unleashed their fury in a tirade against the Haitian Republic, spewing racist propaganda and insisting that Haitian independence must never be recognized. Um, Frederick Douglass, in 1893, aptly described the U.S. government's response to the Haiti Re Haitian Revolution as a demonstration of Americans' discomfort with black freedom and self-determination. Haiti is black, and we have not yet forgiven Haiti for being black. After Haiti had shaken off fetters of bondage, and long after her freedom and independence had been recognized by all other civilized nations, we continued to refuse to acknowledge the fact and treated her as outside the sisterhood of nations. Now here's the main reason that Haiti is currently a shill. It's the French debt. Now, until 1825, the U.S. government could easily justify their non-recognition policy on the grounds that its ally, the French government, was unwilling to recognize the independence of its former colony, Haiti. And from a purely democratic, diplomatic standpoint, it would have been a poor strategic decision for the U.S. to uh, acknowledge Haiti if the French refused to do so. That changed in 1825. Now, obviously, in the early 1800s, the War of 1810, mm -hmm. we were still susceptible to the British taking us over or picking off some of our colonies. So the French were an important ally of ours. Yep. So we didn't recognize them for, for those reasons. So that changed in 1825. In order to gain diplomatic recognition and to gain entrance into the global trade arena, arena the Haitian government entered into a very costly agreement with France. France agreed to recognize Haiti as a sovereign nation, but demanded that Haiti pay compensation and reparations in exchange. The Haitians, with their diplomatic and economic backs against the wall, agreed to pay the French. The French government sent a, term of a, a team of accountants into Haiti in order to place value in all lands and physical assets, including the 500,000 citizens, placed a value on the citizens, mm -hmm. who were formerly enslaved and declared the value at 100, 150 million gold francs which is today around twenty billion. <laughs> In the entire, it was only worth twenty billion. Okay. Payments began immediately, and although Haiti was finally able to officially buy its economic freedom and diplomatic recognition, the debt of one hundred and fifty million francs was a massive burden from which the Haitians have never recovered. Although the official debt was later reduced, force, France forced Haiti to pay an annual fee for its national sovereignty for nearly 100 years, from 1825 to 1922, for almost a century, they paid the penury. And by 1915, Haiti still owned France 121 million francs, and much of their resources went to paying off its debt. For instance, 51% of Haiti's revenues from coffee went to service the debt. 47 went to pay internal debts associated with building the nation's infrastructure, and only 2% of its national income was able to pay for the rest. The reality of suffocating debt uh, then, by more than any other factor, explains why Haiti will eventually become known as the poorest country. And paying the French did not always help diplomatically uh, either. The U.S., for example, continued its policy of non-acceptance of the fledgling republic. Due in part to its diplomatic isolation, debt, and economic struggles, Haiti entered into a troublesome era. Beginning in 1843, there was a series of military coups, and that continued on. Uh, the shift from president to emperor was not only a change in its name, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see, finally, 
Um, the Civil War broke out. Abraham Lincoln enacted the law recognizing Haiti and appointed the first commissioner. Uh, but still, Haiti was not recognized and respected by the United States. While the first hundred years or so of Haitian history was marred by political isolation and economic embargoes that devastated the nation, uh, it, the, in many respects, the next hundred years would be the exact opposite. Rather than being ignored and excluded, Haiti became the subject of conquest, occupation, and control by Western nations, particularly the U.S. Haiti's political victory in 1862 proved to be hollow at best. Uh, we, the exposed, it exposed Haiti to the possibility of foreign intervention and eventually resulted in occupation. Between 1862 and 1950, Haiti experienced tremendous internal turmoil. Dozens of military coups and horrific violence and political instability kept going on. Uh, in many ways, it's, not, it's, it's the story of all countries, right? So, essentially, Germany goes, moves into France, and the, the, it, it, the class system in, in Haiti was essentially you had the French elites, and then you had the offspring of the Haitians and the French elites, the people of color mm -hmm. class, then you had white settlers and merchants, and then you had slaves. Yep. And then that class system kind of endured. And eventually, Germans move in in the late 1800s, and they represent a very small but very economically power uh, at the center of the nation of Haiti. Well, as you know, in, in World War I, we opposed the Germans. And Germany and the Empire started to use Haiti as a base if they needed to attack the United States. And so Woodrow Wilson and Americans became exceedingly paranoid about the Germans in Haiti. Um, and so, as a result, in 1914, following more political conflict among Haitian leadership, the U.S. President Wilson sent American troops to invade Haiti and commence what became a devastating and brutal military occupation. The U.S. occupied and ruled Haiti by force from 1915 to 1934, often using violence to suppress Haitians, in one skirmish alone, the U.S. military killed over 200,000 Haitian protesters. For 19 years, the U.S. controlled customs in Haiti, collected taxes, and ran many governmental institutions. We consolidated the debt with France. We paid it off, mm -hmm. but they, in ex they basically exchanged one creditor for another, uh, and we officially withdrew in 34, but we had fiscal control over the country till 47, and then they paid off their debt to us. Uh, but to do so, to gain their independence from us in the 40s, they had to drain their gold reserves, leading them, leaving them completely bereft of all of their resources. Mm -hmm. And, uh... It was, it was 1940? 1947. 19, what was going on in 1947 in the United States? That yeah, time? right. <laughs> so, as often happens in the wake of an occupation, mm -hmm. a dictatorial regime grows up... Uh, pops up, and that's where you get Papa Doc Duvalier. And uh, the most devastating impact of interference, our interference there, was the ongoing support of the Duvalier regime, which ruled Haiti from 57 to 86. De Papa Doc died, and then Baby Doc took over. Fearful that uh, Haiti would fall to communism, we continued to prop up the Duvalier government. During that 30-year period, Haitians were forced to live under the dictators Papa and Baby Doc. Some members of the Haitian leadership have since claimed that the Duvaliers stole close to $1 billion, and even so, both Duvaliers enjoyed the backing of the U.S. because of their staunch, staunch anti-communism. Um, uh, Duvalier, in 1956, declared him president for life after a dictatorship, uh, after a coup. So, um, as, you, as you see, basically, in all of these examples of, of a dictatorship, Haiti's economy suffered immeasurably from this plan, agriculture production dropped, and they were forced into a dependent and vulnerable economic position in the global market. People starved to death, they had to take on debt by uh, leveraging their economic resources, which means things like the World Bank and the IMF get to take over, and they basically become a, a, uh, a satellite state of the United States in perpetuity because we and our national corporate interests get their global, uh, their global resources. They, we get all the resources. This continues today. So, 
this is the history of Haiti. This is the history of Africa. This is the history of South America. This is the history of the Middle East. This is the history of several Asian countries. Mm -hmm. The West. Uh, certain Eastern, uh, what is it, the Russian state blocs of the Ukraine, yeah. the yeah, and, and Poland. People wondering right. why, why is Poland the way they are? Because, you know, they didn't get as screwed as everyone else. They just kind of watched everyone else. Like, yeah. You know what? We got a country back. F everyone else but Poland. Right. So you have a country that basically through the 17 and 1800s was a col colonial interest. Mm -hmm. There's a revolution. We continue to destabilize mm -hmm. until the current day and prop up dictators who rob the country blind. Yep. And we continue to transfer. We give them aid. And well, you know what aid is? When, As Harry Brown once said, uh, government aid to these poor countries is when you rob the middle class of a rich country to give to the rich class of a poor country. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, giving, that's the other problem. Is like giving aid to a country like that you can really screw up the economics of the whole entire country. Mm -hmm. Just giving out money, giving out, um, you know, devices. It might seem like a good idea, but, you know, like I said, you just screwed over that guy who, you know, makes brooms, digs wells, you know. Now no one's going to pay him for it. You may go like, well, they need clean drinking water. Yeah, economics will pay for it, you know. That's the other thing. It's like when, it's what happens in those countries, but um, with the, uh, the other thing that happens in Haiti is, uh, uh, since we're only about a couple years removed from all the Clinton cash crap, mm -hmm. you also have to think back, like from the um, the hurricane that happened out there in Haiti, and the then all the money getting fed into the Clinton Foundation, and all that getting screwed up, and the different other countries that go over there to different things. The other thing is like the uh, importing of then there's some importing of bad ideas into the Haitian culture and also into Africa that also turns them into crap holes. The that idea, the infectious idea of socialism and communism, get, you know, worms their way into these dictatorial dictators or these people, and they get sold on these ideas without having to understand the economics behind any of that. So it's also for education. So it doesn't matter. Um, so that's what also I guess with uh, also going to argue with race realist is that simple fact that. They like to say Africa and Haiti are crap holes because of race and totally ignore the economics of it. If you look at a country like China, going uh, after um, the uh, after Mao and all that, they were starving and they were basically they were basically a third world co communist country, you know, up until they started to get to the time to get to better different um, uh, economics of the whole situation and they, and they built themselves up out of it. It was... That's just... Oh, thank you. You're thank welcome. you. It's 55. I think it says 55. It's 65. 55 Stop lying. In here. Okay. Why the fuck you lie? It's 65 degrees. 55 degrees in here. My feet are cold. Your feet are cold? Yeah, my feet are cold. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm so Did you know I'm cold? Uh, yeah, but basically you have gloves and three coats on yeah. and a hat, you pussy. It's 55 degrees. Go yeah. go turn it up to sixty seven. I have move. a couple degrees on me. Can't even move. <laughs> you can't even move. <laughs> well, you're the biggest baby I've ever met. Not a baby. Cold. Look, I'm going off tangent on this one. The other thing is, um, uh, Gunther and Lacey, they're, they they don't understand. They're sixty five and like in the house. Gunther's burning. You know, hot. Right. You know, she, she she thinks it's funny when I touch her with my cold hand. I'm over here like. In a heating bag and go like, Ooh, it's so cold. Why is it 65 yeah. in this house? All right, I'll turn it up. Keep talking. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I, I like to thank Christy for having the heat. Um, I'm guessing Christy probably texted um, Chris to turn the heat up. No, my thank feet are cold. Oh, okay. So actually, your feet are cold. Anyway, so yeah, uh, so. Yeah, so those infectious ideas was also like in gone into Haiti. So like when people go out there, but the one thing that um, you also understand is there's some places in Africa that is actually very nice. Um, like there's some places in South Africa, some of the like these massive electronics in there. There's some um, the there's a lot of places dotted around in Africa. Be one, it's so freaking large that is you know you you could tell it apart from. You know, like certain, you know, uh, cities here in the United States. 
other than there's majority of black people around that they have uh, you know just like um, a lot of people like have never really looked at anything but if you look at the um, like for H and M protest uh -huh. and it was like people getting upset about that and rightfully really so but then yeah. you get to see the protest videos and tearing up this gorgeous beautiful South African laws law beautiful I know ones are tearing up and going like and it just helps people to dismiss the idea of what they think of what, what Africa is. Um, I have no plans currently to go to Africa uh, because I don't, you know, if I leave this country to go on vacation, Africa is just, just not where I want to go. I, I, I like driving. If I'm going to drive, if I'm going to leave somewhere, I'm gonna, I want to go on a driving trip and they don't have the roads that I want to go on. Anyways, but that's the point. But, you know, if you really, if you are really hurt about these countries, uh, once you go there and spend money there. <laughs> right. Not, not, not go up there and, um, you know, bring things and buy things for them. Uh, go there and actually spur on economic growth. So go on vacation. Go go there. Go on vacation. You will be shocked how much how far your money goes partying in South Africa. Your biggest expense will be getting there. But once you get there, you will feel like a movie star. I've had a friend. I can't say his name, uh, but I've been trying to get him on to talk about a South Africa trip or just going to Africa. Period that he said he felt like a movie star there because his American dollars went so far there. Uh -huh. That he was there, he said he went to uh, a nightclub and he just got himself bottle service the entire time. Nice. He just, he just went ahead and go, he's just like, I can, he's like, I skipped the line, I went for bottle service, I got a VIP table. He's like, I didn't know anyone from Adam, but I met people because it was like, man, screw this. Yeah. I'm not sitting in this line. And then it was like, when I found out like VIP service was $20. <laughs> I popped bottles like I was popping bottles for thirty dollars. Look at this bottle. Look, look, look at what I got. That's hilarious, you know. But just because of the exchange rate, but like this stuff like that. Okay, back, back to that. But that, but you bringing your dollars there and spending there and just learning about, you know, like going there and learning about a different uh, country. You know, it's a lot more. You know, if you're really upset about it, go there. Spend your dollars there. Help people out there. Spend your money there. You know, that's one thing you can do to help. It. Just the same way at the. You know, if you really care, or you want to fix some of the crap holes here in Indiana, you know. Why do you think, you know, uh, Chris keeps going to Plainfield? It's a crap hole. You know, got to keep going there, keep spending money there, and hopefully it won't be a crap hole all the time. It's getting beautiful now. You know, it's, it's all a, thanks to Chris. Come to Southport. It's beautiful here. It used to be a crap hole. All right. And uh, Beach, Grove, well, you, Beach Grove used to be a crap hole. The people are still here, and they're crappy. You can probably see that Beach Grove Walmart video. But, uh. <laughs> all right, we got to move on to Me Too. And I want to start with uh, these amazing comments by Condoleezza Rice. Oh, and this is beautiful. My her, mom loved this one. Yeah, her, her prescient comments. This is Condoleezza Rice. David Axelrod has a podcast. Uh, I forget what the podcast name is, but it's got David Axelrod. And he was the, the, the guy who ran the Obama campaign. He was the chief strategist. And his podcast is actually really good. And uh, I recommend it. I think you would enjoy it. And I think that you would find... Um, a lot of it thought, thoughtful and stimulating, and it's not liberal, I mean, it's status propaganda, but you'd like it. And so he, he has taken his podcast to CNN, to the uh, TV, and he's interviewing Condoleezza Rice. So that is who is speaking now. I've got to say this for you, quick, real okay. quick. Real quick. Uh, Logan just uh, in the chat just said, I got a boat ride at sunset, dinner and drinks for $20 at the Vindicative Republic. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, he also got diarrhea with that deal. I, I, I doubt that, but like that Logan guy, so that, you know, like, so that's probably like that guy's like top tier thing. So he's helping out the, you know, the economics of the situation. Like, ooh, just vacation, yeah. But that guy, you know, you build up this guy, and he's gonna go like he's got to go like get his boat fixed, get other things fixed. He's got to buy supplies. He's got to get supplied there. And, you know, All right, so. Here we go. This is Condoleezza Rice talking to David Axelrod. You have worked in the most uh, exclusive male corridors of power almost your entire yeah. uh, adult life. I mean, for, for crying out loud, you were the first woman admitted to Augusta, right. uh, the most exalted male uh, preserve. Have you been exposed to uh, harassment over the years? Oh, I've certainly had people say inappropriate things. I've certainly had people suggest that maybe we should just go out and, you know, and, and in situations in which it was somebody more senior than I. Um, and I, I've never faced a quid pro quo, an explicit quid pro quo. Um, I've never had anyone do anything that I would consider assault. 
but I don't know a woman alive who hasn't had somebody say or do something that was uh, inappropriate at best and aggressive at worst. I think that the movement to expose these, uh, these circumstances is a good thing. Uh, let's clear the air about it. I do think we have to be a little bit careful. Let's not turn women into uh, snowflakes. Let's not infantilize women. And what I really don't want to happen is I don't want it to get to a place that uh, men start to think, well, maybe it's just better not to have women around. I've heard a little bit of that. And it, it worries me. Uh, some. Did you see Oprah's speech? At All right. Uh, and I, I've, I think that, uh, honestly, there's some truth to that because mm -hmm. I don't. I, I know you're you're not around the office, but privately, I think there are a lot of conversations going on. A lot of a lot of offices going. Do we want female interns? Do we want more female employees? Do we? How do we behave around our female coworkers? And we we because we are more paranoid. We talked about that on the show. Yeah, there's some female bo uh, bloggers that talk about it that. Uh, there, like she's like a, she talking about she was the only, she's the only female IT tech like you know, in her, uh, you know, in her department, right? And they were sending t people off to conferences, right? They were sending two guys, two guys, two guys, and when it came for like her kind of like time to go and around this area, before they would send her with another guy, but this time they went and got a female from like a, the sales department to send her with. Hmm. It was like, but this is a tech conference. You, you're going to send you with right. the sales slave. I'm guessing most of the guys are like, who's going with me? No. No, I can't yeah. make it. I can't make it. I'm not doing it. Just, And they probably don't think, they're probably good group to guys, but the simple fact that uh, with the story which you're going to go after is, dude, that's some scary crap. You just can't, you know, it's like, wow, man, Big Tau guys, they got something going on here. Maybe, maybe they're correct, you know? Big Tau is uh, men going their own way. That is the pendulum swing of the massive feminist movement that has, like, the third wave that has crept up. The uh, okay. idea of men going their own way that they're basically getting away from, you know, don't dating women, don't have sex with them, don't have any personal, don't have female friends, don't try to, don't try to interact with them. And I was like, wow, that's just like, yeah, but... When you look at all the stuff that's going on, it's like, man, if you did that, you, you're, you're fine. <laughs> well, I personally am a member of uh, NOMAM, uh, National Organization of Men Against Amazonian Masterhood, uh, <laughs> which, uh, oh God, Married with Children was so wrong and so pressing in so many ways. Uh, so the Me Too movement claimed another quote-unquote victim uh, in Aziz Ansari. And uh, <clears throat> let me just say... Um, I work in comedy, uh, and I, I've not met Aziz, but he's been where I work, and everybody says he was super nice, and, uh, you know, there's no rumors, according to several people I talk to, that he's a dick. I know Owen Benjamin uh, was on Stephen Molyneux and said that, oh, he's an asshole. Okay, I can see that. Like, the, the rep on Aziz is that rep is a basic white bitch comedian, and, and by that I mean, like... In the canon of white girl TV shows, mm -hmm. of basic white girl TV shows, there's like Gilmore Girls number one, mm -hmm. and number two is Parks and Rec, and number three is The Office, like, and number four is Sex and the City. Like, they've all seen, like, <laughs> do you watch Parks and Rec? It's like my favorite show. I love, oh, treat yourself. <laughs> like, that is, that is basic white girl Bible stuff. And so Aziz Ansari caters to that. Mm -hmm. He's very smart. He's like, all right, listen, I've got an in with a certain group of people who will buy my material, mm -hmm. so I'll craft stuff to them. Right, yeah, just like Owen Benjamin does that stuff too. Right, Owen Benjamin's now catering to the alt-right crowd. No, he does not cater to the alt-right. Okay, what would you, what, how would you categorize it? I'd say, to me, like, I've listened to some of his stuff to me, he just sounds like he just tries to turn, he, he, he tries to... Let's say new right. Cause I'm not even saying. I'm just saying, just people on the right, just people on right. the right. It's more right. But he's been hanging. He hangs out in like um, the upper part of New York. I don't know. Talk to me now. Uh, Listen. He hangs out in the mid, in the basically out in the woods. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he, 
uh, so he, he's up there out in BFE, so like he hangs out with the like working people. So he, most of this comment is going to be most of the lot most of the time people who are on the right political ideology. Yeah. Adding these new crappy adjectives to it, like I'm alt, like no, no, no. Now see to me because alt right is so lefty. That's lefty. Edgy right. I'll say edgy right. Uh, listen, right. Owen, Owen Benjamin's right. a great dude. I yeah. met I met yeah, him a couple times. Six foot seven. He's, he's huge. huge. Yeah. He's so tall, and uh, I met him a couple times at work. He's a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. Love him. Yeah. Uh, but like uh, even like with Doug Stanhope, Doug, I yeah. don't know, uh, he doesn't like he doesn't really pander to libertarians. He's just out he there. is libertarian. He's it. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't pander to us. Uh, that's a good point. But so uh, you know, I just I get I I hate when there's this thing that they go listen. Uh, Aziz Ansari, hate the guy, hate him, not a fan, not funny, but and this thing here, like, I, I don't know why commentators, especially like conservative leaning or libertarian leaning, listen, the guy's an asshole, hate the guy, not a fan, but gotta defend him. Like, there's that. <laughs> like, Just to show you, like, well, it's yeah, that virtual signal of like, look who I'm, look who right, I'm defending. It's, listen, not, not a fan, not a good, not a good guy. You know, like, okay, we get it. You don't have to, like, and I even found myself, like, listen, don't agree with what he did here, but gotta say, like, you don't have to say anything. Like, you don't have, like, if you, you I, I, I'm not a fan of his comedy. I don't think he's funny. I don't think Parks and Rec is funny. I never have. Uh, love The Office. Just felt like Parks and Rec was a miss overall. Thing, same with 30 Rock. Uh, friends hated it. Basically, I have nothing to talk about. You, you don't like Friends? Don't. Not at all. You know what? What about Gilmore Girls? Like Gilmore Girls. Yeah, that's a good show. Yeah, it's a good show. That's a good show. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I don't hate Aziz Ansari. I just don't find him funny, and I don't get his shtick. And, like, when I think he wears a, a Time's Up thing on his lapel, mm-hmm. like, I think he probably believes that. Mm-hmm. Like, I just don't believe... Everybody's so quick to just go... Tah! He's just uh, wearing that to do this and do this thing to be dishonest and blah. I just think we we are just so quick in this society for whatever reason just to see everybody as an opportunist. Well, uh, so you would think that, but then you've got like this backlog of other crap, like a lot of like um, this. I, I I don't want to not listen. Not, it's not, an, I, I don't want to throw. No, keep going. Yeah, no, I, no, I, no, let's no, not get too derailed. But I'm, I'm just saying, like everybody is just so quick. It, it, maybe some people actually believe stuff. Like, maybe Aziz Ansari actually believes in the Me Too stuff, actually believes Time's Up, supports, is a male feminist. Well, according to this article, it sounds like he is. That whole encounter Ex- sounds right. like it. And maybe he just has no game, and maybe he just doesn't always, he doesn't have enough empathy. I will say, and I'll, I'll say this, I'll preface this, okay? Guys who are super successful, and I've worked with a ton of them, and who are famous, they just don't, they don't view relationships with women like I do. Like, I have to sell dick, okay? And, like, I have to actually, like, convince a woman to look at it, let alone touch it. So, like, I have to be very good at convincing women to sleep with me, hmm. all right? So, guys like Aziz Ansari don't, and so they get real lazy. So when you don't have to work those muscles of... Uh, of it, and it's just fish in a barrel. Mm-hmm. You have no game, and Aziz Ansari has no game, and he is. And I'll tell you where he went wrong. And so we're going to title this segment "A Man's Guide to Having Sex with Women for Women" in, in the Me Too era. Because, like, I asked a lot of female friends about the Me Too stuff and about this account encounter, and so many women said what Aziz Ansari did. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name, is what most men do. And so I think we just need to kind of, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the birds and the bees, Harry. I'm going to break down the birds and the bees and explain to you how to have game. I don't, I don't think I need to teach you, but... I don't have... I feel, but the thing is, I don't have any game. Right. I've never had to have it. Right. Black, I get it. Yeah. No, you know, black guy, they white kids don't really have to have game. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just. I just. I got, want... I got with Lacey when I was like 18. Right. Um, just got done wrestling. 
Yeah, I'm seven percent body fat. You know, <laughs> you want to see my abs? Sure. Yeah, I had like massive six pack abs, and you know, I was getting in MMA, so I was training, eating good. You know, you know, and I've been with her ever since. All right, I've so never had to develop any game. So like this whole encounter, like yeah, that sounds yeah, that sounds part of the course. That's what you do, right? Now many people call me dear leader, and that makes me very wise. I am the leader of, of this land, and uh, I am very successful in all fronts of life, as I have told you many times. And so we're going to we're going to go through this, and I think men need a lesson on how to talk to ladies. And I know there are, there are many virgins in this audience who don't know how to have sex with a woman. They've never seen a boob. Uh, they've seen boobs online, but. Not in real life. And there are many men who are probably making the same mistakes as these are, which are grotesque. He didn't act like a man in this situation, in my, in my opinion. And I also don't feel that uh, this girl, her pseudonym here is Grace, uh, acted like uh, she, was a, she was a coward. Mm -hmm. so, and we'll, so let's dive into it, and then I'll give you some of the feminist reaction to this. Which was scathing. <laughs> so, uh, so again, this is pretty graphic stuff, and I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read it all out. I'm just gonna give you the, the highlights here because you probably have read it. Uh, but if you haven't, I want to make sure that we set it up in case you don't know what's going on. So, uh, essentially, and, and to be clear, um, not good journalism at all, which I'll point out at various points why. This is written by uh, a white girl. Um, her name is... Let's see. Uh, clearly. No, her name's not Clearly. Her name is Katie Way. White girl name. Uh, this is, was published in Babe.com, and Babe is a feminist website. Um, Katie has written such great articles for Babe. Uh, God, sobriety, Mario Kart, just a list of the things we printed... Pretended to like to impress a crush. Am I high as shit, or do these celebrities low-key look alike? Sorry, but Kendall Jenner can't model for shit. <laughs> um, she writes, uh, she's written, The It Girl is dead now because we're all the It Girl. Uh, put your fucking phone away. Your photo op activism is bad for the movement. Um, but you look white. What passing privilege means and why it matters. What life in prison is actually like, according to a girl who grew up inside one. Uh, let's see. Uh, we know which celeb couples will break up in 2018. We tell you. What your go-to selfie pose tells us about you. So clearly, Katie, a hard-hitting journalist, mm -hmm. over at Babe.net. Or Babe, shame her for that hard-hitting journalist. Well, like I've said before, there are a lot of uh, pretend wannabe writers of both uh, genders, or all the genders, who go who grew up watching Carrie Bradshaw or read All the President's Men, and they go to or they read Hunter S. Thompson, and they go to what they go to New York City, and they want to become writers. And uh, then they end up working for Babe.net, talking about which celebrities are going to break up. And then they're friends with a girl who accidentally fucked Aziz Ansari, and then they get their big break. Uh, and then they never get out. Uh, so many of these sites write, like, teenage girl journals mm -hmm. with that awful sarcasm. And Katie is no different than any of them. This is the one that she is... Uh, yeah, don't go to Babe.com. Sorry about that. It's a totally different site than Babe.net. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Rick. Hope that doesn't get you in trouble with your wife. Uh, oh, man. So Katie's big break before this was, Sorry, white people, but trying too hard not to be racist is low-key kind of racist. Uh, now, that is a horrible title, and this is poor writing. Katie, by the way, is also white. Don't get me wrong, it's great that white people care about racism now. That's nice for them. And it's totally sick to hear white guys tell me that they're into brown girls too when they try to get into my pants. And even though ending racism can seem like an impossible dream in a world where Nazis are a thing again, and everyone except me to care about anything related to Bella Thorne, at least diversity is a stated goal now. Progress! I don't know who Bella Thorne is. Who's that? I have no idea who right. Bella Thorne is. I'm trying to do research on babe.com. Okay, all right. The hard-hitting journalism of WeAreLibertarians.com. 
But sometimes when white guys try to be allies, the pendulum swings back into the wrong direction and shit gets straight up offensive. The reductress headline, I don't see color, says the white guy who exclusively dates Asian women is a textbook example of this phenomenon. This is another one. Do you see anything wrong with this picture or this video? Adopting black slang while when trying to appeal to a black audience is unfortunately kind of racist and def definitely appropriative. And even if you're doing it because you think it's cool or even yikes, trying to make someone else feel more comfortable. So, the, the, like, horrific writing. Mm -hmm. This reads like her journal when she was a sarcastic 13-year-old. Sounds like it, yeah. Uh, Bella Thor, born in October 8th, 1997, so that's probably why. She's an American actress, singer, and she played Ruthie Spivy in the television series My Own. I don't Disney. care. I don't uh, care. She's on before she was Big Love, you know, Disney's Channel, Shake It Up. Uh, Babe.net started in May 2016 <laughs> as an experiment by a group of editors in our early 20s. So a lot of life experience in these girls. Uh, we now reach more than 3 million readers a month. And what am I doing wrong? And a million girls follow us on Facebook. Because uh, they go after the uh, teenage money who don't know any better right. and they try to be edgy. It's the same reason why the Pauls have so much freaking money on YouTube. Right. It's um, the same thing. Babe is into good news reporting, trash trends, personal stories, industry-leading analysis of fuckboys, and the pettiest celebrity drama. And we're cool with admitting that we are full of contradictions because all girls are. Oh shit, this sounds like the feminist version of us. We care, we care about the safe sex and access to birth control, but sometimes you just need to pop some plan B. Find us in the gap between our image of ourselves and how we actually behave. Hang with us here, or read our top stories. Where where we tell us where we fucked up. So, just some listen. Some girls out there trying to make it in the world. I get it. I'm mm -hmm. I'm down with it. Uh, yep. So, uh, but that doesn't make them journalists necessarily. Uh, and this girl just basically this reads like a journal. Journalism is not journal writing. Uh, and their sourcing is basically uh, that her friends said this happened. <laughs> And they didn't even wait for his uh, his response, but they add at the end, and then we'll read the statement at the end. So yep, make sure you get that NDA signed before going out on a date. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's an app. Can you look in the Trello what the name of the app is, or it's in the in the Discord chat? Um, what in the as you turn? It's like legal hookup or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's in the Omega Discord chat. Uh, okay, so. This girl, Grace, is she sees at a party Aziz Ansari taking pictures after in 2017 at the Emmy After Awards party with a, a film camera. And as you know, as a 22 year old girl, she was into uh, film as well. And so uh, they flirted a little. He took two pictures of her, and uh, then they would kind of like flirt with each other, talk to each other. And she was there with another guy, and uh, but at the end of the night, at Ansari's suggestion, she put her number in his phone. So when she landed back in New York the next day, she already had a message from him, and they, they kept texting before he asked her to go out on a date. Date didn't go as planned. The night would end with Grace in an Uber home in tears, messaging her friends about how he behaved. Um, so they start flirting, and... Uh, she basically spoke up because he wore a Time's Up pin on the red carpet and she decided to go public with her story. And she felt that he was being hypocritical. Nothing pisses off people more than, than, than when you, they feel you've scored them and they see you as a hypocrite. Uh, so she talked about the date, wore a cocktail chic dress, uh, the photo of the two of them. She looks, she's a beautiful woman, it looks like. They covered her face, but uh, everything else looked beautiful. Uh, they exchanged small talk, drank wine. They went out on a on a dress. Uh, she wore an appropriate dress, cocktail chic. Um, she settled on a tank. She settled on a tank top dress and jeans. Uh, after arriving at his apartment, basically the implication there is she didn't dress like she wanted it, is what they're kind of saying there. Uh, after arriving at his apartment in Manhattan, they exchanged small talk and drank wine. It was white. I didn't even get to choose. I prefer red, but it was white wine. And Ansari walked over walked over to Grand Banks, an oyster bar uh, on the Hudson. So what were they eating? Oysters. She wanted red wine. Well, he they went to 
she met him at his apartment, and he had some white wine out, but she wanted red wine. And so she's upset that, like... How old is she? 12? She's 22 oh, at this point, and he's 34, 35. He's, our, he's my age. And so, like, it's just sort of a weird thing to bitch that, like, I prefer red wine, but he gave me white at his apartment where he was... Clearly, he liked white. Right. <laughs> Let me Uber over some red wine, honey. So, uh, okay. So, they discussed NYU comedy, a new secret project he was working, but she did most of the talking. Uh, she says she sensed he was eager to leave. When the waiter came, he quickly asked for the check, said, let's get out of here, let's get off this boat. The abruptness surprised her. She didn't even, she still had wine in her and more left in the bottle after he ordered. Rick points out what she prefers is free wine. Uh, who doesn't it? Who doesn't in their early twenties? Uh, I'm not. Listen, I'm not against this girl. I feel she feels like this was a traumatic thing. So, I, I I think I'm coming across like I'm making fun of her, and I don't I don't mean I don't intend for that to be the situation because clearly it's it's a brave thing that she's doing by speaking out against this, and I feel bad that like she's kind of being excoriated, but uh, we'll, we'll discuss it after we kind of break it all down. So. Um, like, he got the check, and then was bada-boom, bada-bing, we're out of here. Uh, then he walked two blocks back to the apartment building to an exclusive at address where Taylor Swift has a place. And when they, when they walked back in, she complimented his marble countertops. According to Grace, Ansari turned the compliment into an invitation. He said something along the lines of, how about you hop up and take a seat? Within moments, he was kissing her. In a second, his hand was on my breast. Then he was undressing her and undressed himself, and she remembers feeling uncomfortable at how quickly things escalated. Now, yeah, yeah. dude, okay. This is the first date ever? First, they've met each other, they've spent an hour together. I'm talking about her first date, like, ever. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm. S are you saying this is standard pr operating procedure? <laughs> listen, you listen. You need, I need to teach you the birds and the bees, too. Guys. You've known the woman an hour? Like, first of all, let me clarify. Like, I don't think that sex outside of a relationship is even good. All right? I think it's a waste of time. Like, if you if you are worried that you are a virgin and you're listening to us and you're out there in the middle of nowhere and you're, like, 20 and you're like, I got to get rid of this virginity, like, just wait. <laughs> it's not <laughs> worth it, okay? It, it, it's, like, this entire encounter is why. If you, if you, like, get to know somebody and treat sex like the serious situation that it is, because it is a chemical bonding of two people, and you should have trust with the person that you're having sex with. If you wouldn't want the woman to be the mother of your child, you shouldn't have sex with her. And how can you know that this woman would be a good mother if you've only spent 35 minutes with her at this point? Because there's serious consequences to sex. And neither of these two people, especially him, by pushing the envelope, has, has a respect for the actual cost of what sex is. So, it, it's, uh, it, it, it like, our, I think our society is just so, like, we, we've moved from sex is something you have in marriage to sex is something that you have in a committed relationship to now sex is, should be had at any time, and that is the ultimate goal. And, and that has, and, and men especially, like, the implication is that men are, are just, all they want is sex. That's the ultimate goal. And I think he, he really betrays that. Like, his whole intention, like, oh, I'll take her to dinner, and then I'll just take her back to my place and we'll hook up. He's been trained that way. Because that's what happens to him all the time. I, I don't know him specifically, but I can tell you based on the pattern of the famous successful men that I have seen that are in his age bracket, that's how they behave. If it's easy for them to have sex every night, they will. For the most part. So it's, it's not surprising that he's aggressive and just doesn't think about it. He's like, well, uh, she's, she's talking to me and going out with me. She wants to fuck. You know, because that's what he's used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that right? I mean, it's his choice. It's what he's comfortable with. It's what works for him. And it's up to the woman to say, no, I'm not comfortable with this. And I don't feel that she did that throughout this, and you'll kind of see this next. But 
uh, if you're going to try and uh, if you're not worth 18 million dollars and you're not on hit TV shows and extremely famous this is not the right way to make love to a woman right Harry yeah <laughs> do you do for for you? <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But but like, to me, uh, to me, that just like it does kind of sound like yeah, it sounds like a Wednesday night. <laughs> right for him, I'm saying like no, I'm talking about for me. I'm like Aziz, you know? dude. Take yeah. her, get her another glass of yeah. red wine. No, watch no. watch some TV for a half an hour. Treat her like a person. Take her to Burger King. Okay. Okay. <laughs> let her let her get let her king size it. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, treat her special. Mm -hmm. Let her have it her way. Right. So you can have it your way. Is exactly. What you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah. you bring her home, you know, you open the door for her, you know, because she's got to go over, open your side of the car because your, your door's broken. Oh, I'm sorry, I was talking about people. <laughs> <laughs> talking about your uncle. Yeah. But no, yeah, yeah. No, like, treat her like a person. Like, have a conversation with her. Like, make her feel comfortable in your home in a strange well, environment. Well, that's, that's the thing is, like, she's, like, according to this thing, they're, like, time traveling very, very quickly. I call BS on that. Okay, Because right. it sounds like they were there. So, like, they had dinner for, like, what, 10, 15 minutes? Come on. Then they go back to his place. Come he on. puts her on the marble counter. Come on. Really, that like was, that was like actually she they time traveled. And who who has who has that kind of conversation? That's beautiful. That's two people not making a connection with each other. Like, oh, that's a a nice marble countertop. Yeah, you want to sit on it? <laughs> yeah, hop up on it. <laughs> okay. Up, hey, I've been up there want with, with, with like some chicks that guys like like this car. I guess good suspension in it. Was, you know, in the bounce. So I've got to the switch in this car. I'm like. I am, I am uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just feel like what the way that Anzari is portrayed here is that someone who is not empathetic in any way and mm -hmm. doesn't really treat her as... Uh, I, I don't think he treated her special. I don't think... If, if this is the actual I, I, chain of events, then I don't feel that he treated her like... Uh, he treated her like a person, but he just wasn't... He just... He wasn't very, like, welcoming or... Generous or thorough? Yeah, yeah. He you know definitely I mean? did like, not do the dear leader treatment. Right. But I can really see that he kind of just... See, like, the thing is, trying to say, like, he went through the paces, but to me, you know, I think she was, you know, also... Like, going, like, she wasn't picking up either on his cues, or she also wasn't really listening to him. Sure. And he was picking up on something else, because, you know, she's probably like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he probably was having a conversation with but she was probably just... Too busy being starstruck and not paying attention. To what was going Could on. be, but something just feels off about this story. Uh, so yeah, to me it almost says like um, that one of those like I'll take five uh, I'll take five hundred dollars for things that did not happen, Alex. Uh, see, I don't know. I mean, uh, you, you can't. A lot of this is just you, you could be right. Uh, so, anyways, when Ansari told her he was going to grab a condom within minutes of their first kiss, Grace voiced her hesitation explicitly. I said something like, whoa, let's relax for a second, let's chill. She says she then resumed, he then resumed kissing her, briefly performed oral sex on her, and asked her to do the same thing to him. She did, but not for long. It was really quick. Everything was pretty much touched and done with ten minutes of hooking up, except for actual sex. Okay, so here's where I've got to be on, uh, like... Here's where her signals are mixed. Mm -hmm. Grace voiced her hesitation. Whoa, let's relax for a sec. Let's chill. If she said that, I would say, okay, like, I'm I'm being too aggressive. Mm -hmm. That's how I would pick it up. Like, I, so I'm, I'm something's off in my particular game. Uh, I wouldn't then just like go right back into it. That's why I think he messes up. But if she's feeling uncomfortable. Her lack of emotional courage or ability to express how she is feeling to someone is not his problem. Right. It is not the responsibility of other people to read your mind. Mm -hmm. It is the responsibility of you to say, I do or don't want to do this. In mm -hmm. any situation, work, in relationships, in sexual relationships, in anything. Like, it is not other people's... like. If you're passively aggressively like dropping hints, you're you're the wrong one. You're you're incorrect. You need to have some courage and say what you think. Right, because this is your body. You should be the most passionate, the most you know fervent with these things. Right. The other thing is like 
uh, well, she says chill. Come on, we live in the uh, culture of Netflix and chill. Right. What do you mean when you say chill? And so for uh, and, and some effect, which so she just let him put his you know like head the, down there. The and, ultimate green light was when she went down on him. Right. Like that. That is like go time, right? Well, the, uh, you know, nothing's really go time. You still have to have, like consent through the whole thing. But the thing is like that. Like if you didn't want to. Dude, like, his head, you know, his head was between your legs, you could have just walked off, or he had that, you know, tons of things to walk up on. But right. it's, yeah, that's why, like, it, you know, it sounds like completely mixed signals, or it didn't go the way that, or he's probably just very, also very bad at oral, you know? Or, or there's just, like, there, like, there's no chemistry, but it's, it's, if you have had multiple sexual partners, or even, like, sex with the same person for a long time, you understand that it's not, sometimes there's just not chemistry. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you just don't, you're not on the same wavelength, like, it's just something, everything else clicks in the relationship, but for whatever reason, at this point, you're just like, uh, you don't get it. Like, the, mm-hmm. I'm saying, like, clearly something was off between these two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why, why did he not pick that up? Because he probably didn't think anything was off. Because she was, yeah, yeah. essing the D. Well, yeah, she was S in the D. She allowed him to go between his leg, her legs, and pleasure right. her orally, okay, and then, uh, you know, then asked, f- you know, for, you know, to like get, you know, oral back, and she obliged. Mm-hmm. So it's like to him, hey, this is going the way it is. Okay, yeah. maybe she just does want to just like you know, like it was just you know, maybe she's an oral and first date type of person, <laughs> like okay. briefly performed oral and then said, your turn. Dude, come on. Uh, she says, and sorry, began making a move on her that he repeated during their encounter. The move was taking his two fingers in a V shape and putting them in my mouth, in my throat, to wet his fingers because the moment he'd stick his fingers in my throat, he'd go straight for my vagina to try and finger me. She called it the claw. I don't. <laughs> what? Too much porno. That guy has watched too much porno. That, what are you doing, dude? Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that had to hurt. Yeah, you know, he's probably got awful nails. If you didn't think that, if you don't think that, got very sharp <laughs> nails, dirty oyster nails. I don't know a woman who heard me say that and didn't go, ooh. Yeah. It's like when you, if you didn't see a doctor. Uh, and sorry, also physically pulled her hand towards his penis throughout the night. Uh, from the first time he kissed her on the countertop, uh, he who moved my hand to his dick five to seven times. He really kept doing it after I moved it away. Uh, but the main thing that he wouldn't let her move away from him, she compared the path they cut across the apartment to a football play. It was 30 minutes of me getting up and moving and him following and sticking his fingers down my throat again. It was really repetitive. It felt like a fucking game. Like, huh? That makes no sense. Have you ever been involved in anything that sounds like that? No, no. That, that, me that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. No. That's like, okay, so he was putting his hands in your mouth, and you guys just kept moving around the his house? Is this a, was it his townhouse? Again, as if, if she's telling the it, gospel like, of what happened, like, how did this not guy, guy not pick up on the signals? Right. Unless it wasn't done in some playful manner. Is he a libertarian? No. <laughs> no, I'm saying, like, is he a libertarian? Is oh, yeah, because he's like, yeah, re, you know, <laughs> right. INTJ in it. But, no, it's, no, it just, you know... It's not like he's got no game, no no sexual skill, unless it's all D. He's probably packing very huge. That's probably mm-hmm. the only thing he like. To, that's probably what he uses. That's only, and that's another thing. A lot of men have problem with sex. They view sex as only as pe- uh, penis and vagina. Is yeah. that's that is sex to a lot of men, and just some women too. Um, that that that's what sex is. For so much more to it. There's no communication between these mm-hmm. two, according to the story. Like, if you're a guy out there and you're being this aggressive, you are doing it wrong. Like, I'm telling you. I'm being your friend right now. Get, get some girlfriends, talk to an ex, and say, what am I doing wrong? Because if you're this aggressive, there isn't any woman who wants to be with you. Unless, no, there are some women that are that aggressive. In, in, that no, in the, in the, not in the first session, but in the fi- confines of a trusting relationship where boundaries are established and you all go, this is what I'm into... Okay, I'll do that, but in in terms of like, I want you to claw me on a first date. Nobody's into that. Like you're I just. I don't think anyone's into clawing. First. No, no. <laughs> to just run some weird subset that right. probably somebody in the chat going like, "Dude, I love the claw." And but from every female that I asked about this story, 
was probably about five close female friends, I said, is this representative of how guys act in the bedroom? And they all said yes. Most guys are this aggressive, and most guys don't get the cues. And so I just wanted to like... But the way type of cues? Is it just body language cues? Or a woman language? running away from you while That's you're... That's thing. That sounds like crap to me. That sounds like... What is, you're not Pepe Le Pew. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. This sounds like a freaking cartoon. Like, like this, this is not real life. This doesn't sound real. This poor girl had paint striped. Mean, how big is this townhouse? <laughs> right. This townhouse is huge. All right. Throughout the course of her short time it's in the no no furniture. All right. Throughout <laughs> the course of the course of her short time short time in the apartment, she says she used verbal and nonverbal cues to indicate how uncomfortable and distressed she was. Most of my discomfort was expressed in me pulling away and mumbling. I know that my hand stopped from moving at some points. I stopped moving my lips and turned cold. Okay, well, like, I don't want to date a woman who, like, mumbles. Like, I, I want to, I, I mean, uh, apparently, uh, thanks, Logan. He says there's a clawing section at babe.com. <laughs> um, as, as a man, I don't want a weak woman. And I don't think there are a lot of women who want a weak man. They don't want mumblers. They don't want people who will allow people to do things to them that they don't want to do. Okay. Like, there's a difference between violent assault and what we're hearing here, which is a very, sounds like a very, like, anecdotally, and talking to my friends and hearing their opinions from talking to their friends, this is anecdotally a very common sexual experience in 2018, which is sad. That is sad. Because this is not fulfilling for either one of these people. It's not even worth it. Like, what is the point of this? Like, you'd, you would get more out of the evening by just trying to, like, have a genuine connection with someone and not trying to rush to sex. How about just Hitachi and World of Warcraft? That sound, that's quicker. <laughs> You're done. Oysters would have been cheap because oysters right. for one, wine for one. <laughs> right. Like, nothing about this night sounds fulfilling. Nothing about our sexual culture now is fulfilling. And it just, it's sad to me. And so... I, I look at this and I, I just like want to use my voice to say, like, if you are this guy or if you are this girl, don't be one of these people. Mm -hmm. Like, stand up for yourself. Like, have some dignity and say, no, I don't want you to claw me. Like, so many people, especially at 22, like, I have to give her a break because she's 20 fucking two years old. Like, who at 22 has the courage to stand up and say, no, especially to somebody that is famous that you think could, with one tweet, ruin your life. Like, so I do have to cut her some slack there. First off, but, uh, from what I have experienced, mm -hmm. I recommend not sticking your fingers up anyone unless you have manicured fingers, your <laughs> nails right. are back, and your hands are clean. I, I have. Because if you, have sm if you don't get, if it's not smooth and your fingers got all these massive calluses on it, that's fun for no person. Two, wants that. No two, one wants that inside person. Two is aggressive. Two fingers in the first place. So, anyways, but my point is, Grace... Say to the man, I am uncomfortable right now. You are making me uncomfortable. I am not enjoying the situation. Please mm -hmm. stop. Put on your clothes and leave. Or say, I like you. I think you're a very nice person, but this is a little faster than I... Like, that's what men want to hear. Like, they want to hear, uh, not two fingers in the claw. Try one. Right. Or, I don't like when you do this. Mm -hmm. Like, men want direction. Men are very stupid. Mm -hmm. Men are very stupid, and I include myself. Like, when it comes to sexual relationships, men need to be hit in the face with a shovel. And so, to him, to Not his dumb... shovel. I'm going to say pay extra for the shovel. To his dumb brain, he is seeing, well, she's had her mouth on my penis, so it's a go time. I just need to be more aggressive mm -hmm. and do more of that because it seems to be working. Or he's also had other relationships where some women just like, I'm with the star, I'm going to fake it, this is what all women like, right. yada, 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 like it. When it's to someone, they're like, hey, I don't like this. Right. That's another thing is, you're right, men take very good direction. So, like, also, if, you know, you fake an orgasm with the man, if you actually show him how to give you one, trust you, he's going to do that. It will do whatever it takes. Day. Yeah, whatever it takes. Every freaking time, especially if he knows he's doing it right. Men are strategists. He wants, you know. We like, want to win the battle and the war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You tell us how to do it. Right. Because, yeah, and the thing is, it's like, well, you should know. Nope, we do not. We, we do we, no we clue. We don't know. We mm -hmm. don't know. And the info tapes that we have, the millions and billions of videos that we've watched on live has not prepared us. No, no. Porn is like the worst thing you can do to yourself. If you're a young man out there, 
like porn is not indicative of anything in real life. It is, and it, and it, and it truly does block you from having true intimacy and understanding what true intimacy is. Like if you're a woman and uh, you have met a man who knows what he's doing, it's because some woman out there had the courage to say, hey dummy, stop doing that. <laughs> like, so be that woman. Be the man who says, uh, maybe sh chasing her around the apartment isn't the right thing to do. And be the woman who says, I'm uncomfortable, please do this, or don't do this. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the whole, the whole thing here. Uh, so he didn't notice her reticence or knowingly ignored, it is impossible for her to say. I know I was physically giving off cues that I wasn't interested. I don't think that was noticed at all, or if it was, it was ignored. And sorry I wanted to have sex. She remembers asking him again and again, where do you want me to f, f you? While she was still seated on the countertop, she said she found the question tough to answer because she didn't want him to do it at all. She, I wasn't even really thinking about that. I didn't want to be engaged in that with him, but he kept asking. So I said, next time. And he goes, oh, you mean a second date? And I go, oh, yeah, sure. And he uh, goes, well, if I poured you another glass of wine now, would it count as our second date? Which, like, dude, okay. Wow. That's a scumbag line. Like, we know, you realize what's going on. Like, a comedian, comedians are high intelligent people, and the majority of them are sensitive people. I, I just have a hard time believing he didn't know what was up. Um, he then poured her a glass, handed it to her, she excused herself to the bathroom. Uh, she spent about five minutes in there collecting herself. Uh, she went back to Ansari, asked if she, he asked if she was okay. I said, I don't want to feel forced because then I'll hate you, and I'd rather not hate you. Um, she, she said at first he, she was happy how he reacted. He said, oh, of course. It's only fun if we're both having fun. The response was technically very sweet in acknowledging the fact that I was very uncomfortable. Verbally in that moment, he acknowledged that I needed to take it slow. So let's just chill over on the couch, he said. Um... This moment is particularly significant because she thought that that would be the end of the sexual encounter. His Her remark about not wanting to feel forced had added a verbal component to the cues she was trying to give him about her discomfort. Mm -hmm. When she sat down on the floor next to Ansari, who sat on the couch, she thought he might rub her back or play with her hair, something to calm her down. Ansari instructed her to turn around. He sat back, pointed to his penis, and motioned for me to go down on him. And I did. I think I just felt really pressured. It was literally the most unexpected thing I thought would happen at that moment because I told him I was uncomfortable. So, again, a failure on both parts. And I just have to say, like, as a 35-year-old man dealing with a 22-year-old woman, you know what you were doing. You have the opportunity to be a decent man. Like... I, I think there there needs to be a, a conversation amongst men that says, why don't you try decency? <laughs> like, I know that the the uh, the trope is that we're all just sex starved maniacs and we have no responsibility or control over what our penis does, and we just all we want to do is fuck all the time. Like, no, you you should have some decency. Like, you should have some respect for a woman and say. Uh, I totally get it. Game over. Instead, you, like, sit down and go, mm, penis, mouth, you. Like, like to me, this is a failure of him as a more mature, a more experienced man taking advantage of a young girl who he knows... It's like the Louis C.K. line, which I thought was just so fucking, like, oh, that's exactly it. Like, he, where he basically says... Uh, you know, me asking to masturbate in front of them, yes, they had the opportunity to say no, but I wasn't posing a question to them, I was posing a predicament. And I think Aziz Ansari knows his responsibility, knows what he's doing, and he's misusing it. Like, that part right there tells me that the dude was, like, taking advantage of somebody that he knew he could manipulate. That's where I have a problem with it. Like, you as a man have a responsibility to not manipulate people. And you have to be aware of when you're causing someone a predicament in sexual situations. Like, it, it just... I, I just... Uh, well, it's all on the woman to be the one that says no and stop. I don't agree with that. I, th I think that men have just as much of a responsibility to make sure that if you're knocking on the door, are you okay with this? No. Okay. Game over. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but... 
to I believe just, that just you're saying, and I, and I agree. Listen, just because two people are naked in a bed together, it doesn't mean she wants to have sex with you. Check first. Ask nicely. And sh I would say... Married, no, I don't have to check. Yeah, I know. But in my situation, as a, ma as a single man who's dating, 50% uh -huh. of the time it's no, I don't want to right now. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just think about all... I, it really hit me in the middle of the Me Too stuff in a recent situation where it... A lot of guys just don't even ask that question. They just go for it. And then the woman goes, well, might as well. I'll just get through this. Got to keep going to it till you know. Right. And I just don't believe in that. I think, like, that's disrespectful of the person that you're with. Yeah. And I think that there is an opportunity for men to be decent and to be respectful. And especially a guy who is as, as aware of human relationships as as Aziz is mm -hmm. in a situation with a 22 year old girl who is like got in a situation where she's clearly having a if this is all how it went down she's clearly freaking the fuck out how do you not notice that she's going to the bathroom splashing water on her face she's freaking out you know, like come on dude yeah I, yeah I get that that's why this whole story Sounds just like a fictional story. There's some mm -hmm. fluff. To me, it sounds a lot of fluff has been added to this. I tell me some things feel like the timeline is screwed up on this whole thing. And that this this whole story makes no sense. Right. Okay? Sounds like his apartment, his townhouse is, you know, 3,000 square feet. Uh, you know, that someone went to the bathroom. So she was alone in the bathroom. Did she have her phone? Text? She could have got an Uber then. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do anything. She didn't... You know, she felt like she couldn't say this to his face. And then it was like, so you sat down and like, well, I want him to calm me down. Did anything, is any of the cues look like he was into calming you the at, F down? At, at, is this a person? At what point did any of this sound like, what, he wanted to calm you down with his D? He wanted to calm you down with Right. Like, at what point is this the type of person that will calm you down? Yeah, go rub your back. She barely rubbed your... Oh, good. Right, like he he, brief, what, he yeah, briefly see up, yeah, that yeah. Other word. like he he's just not being in my it's not a dirty word, yeah, rubber like, clit, rubber, you know, rub it, relax it. He, he wouldn't even right. do that for a long period of time, and you think he's gonna rub your back for any time? That seems missing cues on her point there. That's why I said this whole thing sounds weird to me. Yeah. So, uh, so anyways, uh, rubber back, go down him, she did. Soon he pulled her back onto the couch. She would tell her friend later in the text night, he made out with me again, says, doesn't look like you hate me. Halfway into the encounter, he led her from the couch to a different part of his uh, apartment. Uh, it, Larry Brown asks, why are men responsible to stop? I'm not saying that you have all of the responsibility, but I'm saying that you do have some responsibility if you, you, you can ask the question. I'm not saying that... Uh, you are, like, in Britain, it was the man's job. So so this is, and I thought Ben Shapiro had a really interesting point on this. Uh, he said, you know, back when society considered sex, like, he, men's sexual desires have not changed. They want to procreate. They want to have sex. Women's liberation, women and feminism has has gone from, you have sex inside of marriage, everybody understands that is the, the deal, that if you want to have sex, then you get married. And then it moved to you only have sex inside of a committed relationship. And then it now it's you want to have sex all the time. It is your duty as a woman to have as much sex as you want. You are... I have a lot of young female friends who are virgins who are ashamed for that. And, and like, when, you need to lose your virginity as fast as possible. And so, like, that, that notion of virginity is, is they're being treated like men. Mm -hmm. So everybody's equal. Everybody's pressured to lose their virginity as soon as possible. And uh, he said, uh, Ben Shapiro went on, like, so when you change the, the institution of chastity and you demean it and you change its meaning and, and all the rules are completely unwritten and there are no clear social norms anymore then you get all of these messy situations and so the expectation that I take you out on a date we're not going to have sex we're going to bond with one another we're going to have a conversation we're going to get to know each other without the complications of sex what was wrong with that and I completely agree with that like what what is you know if, if your goal in dating is to get laid that's fine if that's your goal 
But if your goal is to, I'm going to get laid and then try and find out if this person is a life partner, you've really started in a weird, precarious position. If you have sex on the first date and then try to figure out if they're a life partner, I think that that is, in my experience, that is far less... Uh, the success rate's far less. Now you're like, see, now you can see, hit on re, re, the reason why you see a lot of couples, the newer couples, are meeting online, right? Mm -hmm. From video games. Because when you're meeting someone in a video game, they can live not close to you, you know, and the, you're doing an activity that you both love, you both enjoy doing, and you enjoy that activity, you get to know each other, and it explains why there's so many more relationships like. How'd you meet her? Oh, I, you know, we raided, like, we did over 600 hours of WoW together, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, so we just, you know, decided to hook up. I was like, okay, that makes sense, especially this day and age, because you're right, like, it would be, um, I think if I wanted to really just spend time with somebody, or just to get to know them, like, yeah, to me, I'd get to know someone better to see how they handle the sticks. Right. You know? Pick up some sticks and see how you handle them. Right. Like, it, it really is about getting to know a person understanding if you share the same values, mm -hmm. understand if you shame, share the same interests, if this is a person that would be a stable life partner, a stable parent, uh, genetically a good choice for you to procreate with, and then you introduce the concept of sex. Like, And, and to me, the, the more time between introduction and coitus, the, <laughs> to use the Sheldon, the better off you're going to be. Coitus. Like, coitus. Coitus. I, I I just I just look at the 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 soup of emotion and miscommunication and misunderstanding and mistrust that goes into this entire situation and I just go you know that the solution is here not to have sex like not to make that your goal like if you, having sex is your goal fine but I just don't I don't personally know a lot of people where that is their actual goal like, I think there is a myth out there that everybody's looking to hook up, and I'm sure that there are a fair percentage of people, but I think, by and large, most people are looking for connection and meaning more than they are sex. Uh, a lot of the girls I do talk to, they talk about when they get on Tinder and they look at a guy's profile, the main thing they're looking at, their profile, the main goal, and if they can't do this, they're not going to think about having sex with them, is that they want to play with your dog three times. They want to <laughs> pet your dog. Right. They want to play with your dog. Right. You take them to the, you know, they take their dog and your dog out to, like, the dog park, and they want to do that three times without even think about even remotely having sex with you. Like, have you had your heart broken, Harry? Yes. Yes, I have. I've had my heart broken, yeah. ripped out of my chest six times since I've been divorced in four years. Ouch. And that is because I was hell-bent on being in a relationship, because I had a need to be loved, to be externally validated... To prove to my ex-wife that I was worthy of being in a relationship. And so I would attach myself to whomever would have a conversation with me for a period of two years after my divorce. Mm. And it caused me great misery. And fortunately, you know, I had a therapy session today and it was just, it was great. And she was so happy. She goes, you look like a different person. What's different? And I said, there, there isn't any, anything anybody can take from me. Like, there isn't anything I need from the world. Like, I, like, the life that I came in here two and a half years ago mm -hmm. wanting, I have now. And I'm very blessed and content with it. And now when I date, it's to add something to my life, not to fill a need. Good. Good. And, yes. Yeah. And, and, and so sex isn't the goal. A life, like a partner, uh, a person to be my companion, that mm -hmm. is the goal. And there was a period of time where sex was my goal, and it just was very awkward. It led to a lot of awful situations. It led to me getting my heart broken, broken because I was rushing into relationships trying to have sex because that's the quickest way to get validated. And it just wasn't worth it. It just was not worth it. And I, I just don't, I don't buy, I don't think that I'm that much more of a moral person than the average human being. I think... Like, I just think most people kind of want the same thing. They want to be loved. They want to have kids. They want to have financial security. They want to have liberty. They want to have freedom. They want to have a good job, good friends. Like... It's going to be like Grindr so popular. Right. No one's on Grindr for, for uh, uh, long-term relationships. Right. 
And if that's what you're into, cool. That's good. Yeah. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it's not something I can do, and I find it to be meaningless, but if you can, if, if you don't, like, I'm a very sensitive person, <laughs> yeah. you know, and so I have an emotional connection to sex where a lot of people don't, and that that's makes me different than them. Yeah. Yeah, no. and there's nothing wrong with that. I have a very emotional connection with sex. Right. You know, I've, it's very emotional. Yeah. Uh, I think I've had, Larry can't wait for a little deer leader. I've only yeah. Because please, I'm, everyone, pray that. <laughs> oh. uh, Seventeen days and counting. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I've only because like I've only had one sexual. In, uh, I've only been sexual with one person, so mm -hmm. it's you know, but it's very emotional to me. Sure. How it is. I, if I had to do it over again, yeah. I would go back and I would. That's how I'd be. I mean, I wouldn't. I would. I would change a lot about the last four years, yep. to be honest, because yep. it has, it has not been as fulfilling as I thought it would be, because because I waited till marriage. Mm -hmm. I lost my virginity at twenty six oh, when wow. I got married, so I was an old virgin. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I you waited four more years, right? When I got divorced, I was like, well. You know, I'll just be a slut now. Didn't work out. It, 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 I mean, listen, it worked out plenty of times, but it wasn't as... <laughs> <laughs> like, there's, it's what you know, it worked out. Right. I, I just think it... Uh, but it, it, it leads you into heartbreak quicker, and if you, can, if you can become secure in yourself and happy with yourself, that should be the goal. Yeah. And if another person can compliment that, then that is good. But if, if you're doing... If you're dating or having sex for reasons other than genuine emotional connection with a person, it's not worth it. Well, from, because uh, this June, uh, Lacey and I have been do uh, dating and together for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there's, I'm sure there's people listening to like, well, ah, 15 years, their relationship is so young. And I get that. And the main thing I get from these people is that eventually, you know, you have to build, the, the relationship gets built off of more than sex after a while. Right. And you have to have that, you know, like that companionship. So if you end up, like, in a relationship or with somebody that the only thing you guys had to, you know, thing was sex. Maybe that worked out for you, but is it going to go after seven years? No. How, how are you going to do after seven years after that? Yeah. Like, so I, 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 if you're if you're a young guy out there and you want more along these lines, there's a great podcast called Mating Grounds, and I've recommended this book before. It's called Mate by Tucker Max and Jeffrey Miller. Jeffrey with a G. Uh, and basically, Tucker Max was the guy who wrote I Hope They Serve Beer right. in Hell, yeah. and uh, Assholes Finish First, and he basically in his 20s was just a huge slut, and, you know, had sex with, like, Britney Spears and a bunch of famous people, and uh, Jeffrey Miller's an evolutionary biologist, so he basically, like, comes at it from the evolutionary angle, and they basically outline attraction, and... You know, Tucker Max is a much different person than he was and in a, in a marriage at this point. And basically they go through how to make yourself more attractive to women. And it's not through negging and doing a bunch of the dumb shit that you read in the game and okay. all this manipulative crap that you read. You know, I love Robert Greene's books. I think they're brilliant, but they're not like you know, quit trying to be, go after the sirens, <laughs> like, just be a genuine person, that's what people want, they want authenticity, and, like, Mate and the Matings Ground podcast, I think, will do you a lot of good, and, and I think it helps women, too, I think if you're trying to figure out what makes, what is human, what is the foundation of human attractiveness, well, look at Aziz Ansari, he has social proof, other people talk about Aziz Ansari, he has financial means so he has the ability to take care of his mate financially he has physical looks uh he is uh he is an intelligent person comedy is comedy you can't be funny if you're stupid like you just can't be uh at least well you can be not, dumb not, not, not like on purpose funny yeah. uh <laughs> yeah. but yeah. just won't be successful either. right like so Aziz Ansari has these traits that make him attractive, and so that's why he's attractive. And so you have to find out what you're good at. For me, I'm an intelligent person who is funny and and uh, like physically, I'm I'm like a two, but like mentally, intellectually, I'm like an eight. <laughs> you know, so the, and so women will be attracted to the intelligent side, even though I'm a big fatty. 
So you you have different things, that, and I have social proof. I have people who say I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. And the beard helps, and the podcast has right the podcast. The beard, social proof. The beard is physical attractiveness. When we get um, Clayton's truck, and we'll get that all about that. that <laughs> extra, extra two to you. You just got to make sure your truck is black, and we'll make it look nice. So essentially, uh, then they try to watch Seinfeld, and she'd never seen Seinfeld. Come on. Oh, you should um, end of the date. Yeah. End of the date right there. Like, what? So yeah. she essentially says, you guys are all the same. She leaves. Uh, she felt violated. I felt really emotional at once. We sat down there. The whole experience was actually horrible. You should feel violated. You never saw, you know, sign for So this is, this is his uh, statement. Um, they, he, he, he released a statement denying sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct is like a new term in the last year. And it's a great term to just smear anybody with anything. And it's just like a nice little basket word. And so every, every single human being on the planet has committed sexual misconduct at, at, conduct at some point. And it sounds very official. N very few people have committed sexual assault. Sexual battery. But everybody's, you know, so you can smear everybody with it. Uh, and sorry says, in September of last year, I met a woman at a party. We exchanged numbers. We texted back and forth and eventually went on a date. We went out to dinner and afterwards we ended up engaging in sexual activity, which by all indications was completely uh, consensual. The next day I got a text from her saying that although it may have seemed okay, upon further reflection, she felt uncomfortable. It was true that everything did seem okay to me, so when I heard that that was not the case for her, I was surprised and concerned. I took her words to heart and responded privately after taking the time to process what she had said. I continue to support the movement that is happening in our culture. It is necessary and long overdue. I feel like I do need to um, say um, that I don't think that this printed out the actual text messages, but you know, at, at every point when she said she felt uncomfortable, he stopped. And when she texted him and said, I didn't think that was okay, he apologized. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not the signs of a sexual predator. Right. Yeah. Like, it's just not. Yeah. You know, but again, it's just yeah. this... He's not, like, raping some passed out girl out behind a dumpster. Right. Like, was he one... Like, I think we kind of broke this down, but, like, neither of them were uh, angels in this situation, but I, I feel that he definitely took advantage, and he was pushing the envelope, and he, being the older person in that situation by nearly 15 years, should know better in a lot of those situations. So, um, all right, so this is from The Atlantic, and uh, the feminists went nuts about this, and not in the way that you think. So, uh, Vox wrote a piece that was kind of anti-Anzari, uh, the Aziz Ansari story is ordinary, and that's why we have to talk about it. Uh, and so they kind of outline it, and they outline some of the stuff that we've kind of talked about, the problems with it, um, and and kind of push the narrative that we said where women need to... Like, there's here's the problem. Like, in the chastity system, <laughs> like, everybody's clear on what the roles are going into it, mm -hmm. you know, and... I, I have found that there has been kind of, as I've had conversations with women over the last couple of years, you, like the first question I'm asked on Bumble now is, what are you expecting from this? And I say, I'm looking for a long-term relationship with somebody that I care about and respect. And they go, good, me too. Because they're tired of getting the dick pic messages right away saying, I'm, let me lick your asshole. Like, it's... It's just, it's, uh, it's miserable out there for women, and they're tired of our shit. Mm -hmm. And it's the guys who send abusive messages on Tinder that ruin it for the rest, of, like, the other 60%. You know, so I just... Yeah, and, I, and to balance it out, let's balance with the scales. I was hit women real quick. Women, 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 women. Go for it. It's the foodie call women. You know who you are out there on Tinder and Bumble that have no intention of sleeping, have continue the relationship with somebody, you're doing it because you're hungry, or you just want to get around, <laughs> and be like, hey, I can't believe you're saying that's sexist, come on, come on, 
Mm -hmm. I've got I can get on the internet right now and I've got I can get here and whisper and I can show you all kinds of women who invented doing that. Of course, and I will tell you there is a, for a one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. She admitted to me that she went out on about five more dates with me than she wanted to, mm -hmm. just because she liked she kind of liked getting free food. Yeah. And you know, but I had the last laugh because she's she and I have become best friends. Nice. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like those extra five free meals that she was looking for, mm -hmm. like kind of kept us. It became more about friendship because mm -hmm. there wasn't anything physical between us. Mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't like she. I don't know. She's just yeah. super awkward. Yeah. And, and uh, so, so then, but then I kind of changed over the course of the friendship based on therapy, going mm -hmm. to therapy, and she's like, "You're yeah, actually all right." <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and and it's great that self reflection like that, and that's why like I thought it was funny with the guy who was doing that. He would order massive steaks and disappear in the middle of the dinner right. after eating his steak. And it was his massive expensive meal. Go to the bathroom and just doop skadoodle. It's hilarious. So this is uh, from the Atlantic by Van R. Newkirk. She's a feminist, yeah. and uh, the humiliation of Aziz Ansari is the title of it. And uh, later on in the article, she writes, was cause she kind of compares her growing up and how to deal with sexual relationships. Um, was Grace frozen, terrified, stuck? No. She tells us she wanted something from Ansari and that she was trying to figure out how to get it. She wanted affection, kindness, attention. Perhaps she hoped to maybe even become the famous man's girlfriend. He wasn't interested. When she felt afterwards rejected yet another time by yet another man was regret. And what she and the writer who told her story created was 3,000 words of revenge porn. The clinical detail in which the story is told is not intended to validate her account as much as it is to hurt and humiliate Ansari. Together, the two women may have destroyed Ansari's career, which is now the punishment for every kind of male sexual misconduct, from the grotesque to the disappointing. And I think that's, like, the point. Like, it's disappointing, that account, but that's also kind of like a private thing between those two people. That's right. not a crime. Nothing that he did was a crime. Mm -hmm. And so I think she kind of had a point about the revenge porn. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The real winner was uh, by, uh, I wish that uh, I had printed her name. <laughs> but the, the lady the, who wrote the article? Not New York Times, yes, the feminist that wrote this article. Aziz Ansari is guilty of not being a mind reader. I'm apparently Ouch. the victim of sexual assault, and if you're a sexually active woman in the 21st century, you are too. That is what I learned from the expose, quote unquote, of Ansari published this week by the feminist website Babe, arguably the worst thing that has happened in the Me Too movement since it began in October transforms what ought to be a movement for women's empowerment into an emblem for female helplessness. The headline primes the reader f to grid for the very worst. I went on a date with Ansari. It turned into the worst night of my life. Like everyone else, I clicked. The victim of this 3,000-word story called Grace, not a real name, and her saga with Mr. Ansari begin, blah, 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 blah. They go on. Uh, and so she kind of describes what happened. Um... They got dressed, sat on the couch, watched Seinfeld, said, hey, you guys are all the same. He called her an Uber. She cried, fiend. If you are wondering about what about this constituted the worst night of Grace's life or why it is being framed as a Me Too story by a feminist website, you probably feel as confused as Mr. Ansari did the next day. It was fun meeting you last night, he texted. Last night might have been fun for you, but it wasn't fun for me, she responded. You ignored clear nonverbal cues. You kept going with advances. You had to... You had to have noticed I was uncomfortable, he replied with an apology. Read Grace's text message again. Put in other words, I am angry that you weren't able to read my mind. It is worth carefully studying Grace's story. Encoded in it are new, yet deeply retrograde ideas about what constitutes consent and what constitutes sexual violence. We are told by the reporter that Grace says she used verbal and nonverbal cues... Uh, she adds that whether Ansardi didn't notice, uh, it is impossible for her to say, but we were told he wouldn't let her move away from him in the encounter. Uh, he said that it was all consensual. I'm a proud feminist, and this is what I thought while reading Grace's story. If you are hanging out naked with a man, it is safe to assume he is going to try to have sex with you. If the inability to choose a pin, pinot, uh, pinot noir? 
over Pinot, Pinot Grigio. Pinot, yeah, Pinot Noir. Noir over Grigio offends you, you can leave right then and there. If you don't like the way your date hustles through paying the check, you can say, I've had a lovely evening and I'm going home now. If you go home with him and discover he's a terrible kisser, say, I'm out. If you start to hook up with him and don't like the way he smells or the way he talks or doesn't talk, end it. If he pressures you to do something you don't want to do, use a four-letter word, stand up on your two legs, and walk out the door. And sorry sounds like he was aggressive and selfish and obnoxious that night. It isn't, isn't it heartbreaking and depressing that men, especially ones who present themselves as feminists in public, so often act this way in private? Shouldn't we try to change our broken sexual culture? And isn't it enraging that women are socialized to be docile and accommodating and to put men's desires before their own? Yes, yes, yes. And I agree with that. I agree with everything she just said. But the solution to these problems does not begin with women torching men for failing to understand their quote-unquote nonverbal cues. It is for women to be more verbal. It's to say, this, what, this is what turns me on. It is, it's to say, I don't want to do that. And yes, it sometimes means saying, piss off. The single most distressing thing to me about her story is that the only person with any agency in the story seems to be Aziz Ansari. Grace is merely acted upon. Agency means that she has the ability to make decisions for herself, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you may hear that word agency, that's what it means. Yep. That she is a thinking being who has control over herself. She is an individual. Couldn't be a more libertarian concept. Exactly. Uh, all of this put me in the mind of another piece published this week, this one by the novelist and feminine icon, uh, feminist icon Margaret Atwood. My fundamental position is that women are human beings, she writes, nor do I believe that women are children, incapable of agency or making moral decisions. If they were, we're back to the 19th century. And women should not own property, have credit cards, or have access to higher education, control their own reproduction or vote. There are powerful groups in North America pushing this agenda, but they are not usually considered feminists. Except increasingly they are. Uh, Grace's story was met with so many digital hosannas by young feminists who insisted that consent is only consent if affirmative, active, continuous, and, if this word is most used, enthusiastic. Consent isn't the only thing they are r radically redefining. A recent survey by The Economist YouGov found that approximately 25% of millennial-age American men think asking someone for a drink is harassment. More than a third of millennial men and women say if a man compliments a woman's looks, it is harassment. To judge from social media to the Grace story, they also see a flagrant abuse of power in this sexual encounter. Yes, Mr. Ansari is wealthy celebrity with a Netflix show, but he has actual, no actual power over Grace, professionally or otherwise, and lumping him in with the same movement that brought down men who ran movie studios and forced themselves on actresses or the factory floor supervisors who demanded sex with women work, woman workers, trivializes what Me Too stood for. I'm sorry Grace had this experience. I have too had lousy romantic encounters, as has every adult woman I know. I have regretted these encounters and not saying anything at all. And I have regretted them and said so like Grace did, and I know I'm lucky that none of these unpleasant moments were far enough from being anything approaching assault or rape, or even the worst night of my life. But the response to Grace's story makes me think many of my fellow feminists might insist my experience was just that. And for me to define it otherwise was nothing more than my internalized misogyny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> misogyny. Uh, there, is this, there is a useful term for what Grace experienced on her night with Mr. Ansari. It's called bad sex. It sucks. The feminist answer is to push, push for a culture in which boys and young men are taught that sex does not have to be pursued like they're in a porn film, and one in which girls and young women are empowered to be bolder, braver, louder about what they want. The insidious attempt by someone to criminalize awkward, gross, and entitled sex, boy, every libertarian would be a criminal, mm -hmm. takes women back to the days of smelling salts and fainting couches. That's somewhere I, for one, don't want to go. Yeah. When they talk about, like, who's going to teach men, oops, that's... Sorry, the activity of the other person in the sexual counter yeah. teaching the other person how they want to be pleased. It's a be right. Be, yeah. Be, and it was like, well, what is my responsibility? Trust me. Uh, if, um, how many times have a guy has said, like, hey, you know, I like that you have enthusiasm when you're giving me oil, but, you know, uh, 
if you could. The dryness on your tongue, yeah, it doesn't flee the best. Can I have a little more saliva? You need a water. Also, the teeth, come on, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, also, you know, uh, while you're down there, you wear this hat. It just makes me feel better. Wear this hat. Yeah, make America, make America great. <laughs> you, you want Lacey to wear a MAGA hat yeah, while she's going down on you? Oh, man. It really gets you going? Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> You're hate fucking the president? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> man. Uh, all right, so I feel we're, we're done with that. Uh, we've, we've, officially, yeah. we've officially explained away the, the world where everyone's problems are solved. A mm -hmm. couple of quick stories that I want you to be aware of. Uh, this just coming through while we were on the podcast. Uh, a former CIA officer suspected by investigators of helping China dismantle United States spying operations and identify informants has been arrested, the Justice Department said uh, today. The collapse of the spy network is one of American government's worst intelligence failures in recent years. The arrest of former officer Jerry Chun Jerry Chun Singh Lee, 53, capped an intense FBI inquiry that began around 2012, two years after the CIA began losing its informants in China. Investigators confronted an enduring mystery. How did the names of so many CIA sources among the agency's most dearly held secrets end up in Chinese hands? Some intelligence officials believe that a mole inside the CIA was exposing its roster of informants. Others thought that the Chinese government had hacked the CIA's covert communications used to talk to foreign service, foreign sources of information. Um, still, other former intelligence have also argued that the spy network might have been crippled by a combination of both as well as sloppy tradecraft by agency offers in China, the counterintelligence investigation into how the Chinese managed to hunt down American agents with a source of friction between the CIA and FBI. Uh, Mr. Li, who left the CIA in 07, has been living in Hong Kong and working for a well-known auction house, was apprehended at Kennedy Airport on Monday and charged in federal court in Northern Virginia. Uh, so, uh, just to let you know, we have a real-life trader on our hands. So, kind of like that Snowden <clears throat> or the Chelsea Manning. Right. Who is running for Senate? Yep. Uh, listen, I... Uh, respect what Chelsea Manning did, but I do find that the excessive use of emojis is a sign of mental illness. <laughs> so, I I had to unfollow her because I just couldn't take it anymore. I plan on talking about that tomorrow. Alright. So, if you want, you know, because I've got some choice words for it. Uh, finally, schools attempt to ban kids from having best friends because it's not inclusive by Kat Temp on NationalReview.com. Uh, Social engineers and language police won't change human nature. We all like some people much more than others. According to a U.S. piece in News and World, U.S. News and World Report, some schools in the U.S. and Europe are attempting to ban the entire concept of children having best friends because it's not inclusive and kids get hurt. The notion of choosing best friends is deeply embedded in our culture, uh, said in the piece, should schools ban kids from having best friends. According to Greenberg, there is something dreadfully exclusionary occurring when a middle schooler tells the girl sitting next to her that she is best friends with the girl sitting in front of them. Child after child comes into my therapy office distressed when their best friend has now given someone else this coveted title. <laughs> Fuck you, you lunatic. Tom Brady deemed out there to be a uh, bully. <laughs> really? Yeah, she's gonna be a bully. She's gonna be a bully, is she? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You it's feel easier. that's healthy? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It's gonna be easier... Um, because a lot of people will, will hate her all through school. Right. But when they're like, but her, everyone around her will do so much better because, you know, they She'll, actually she, had a, you know, actually did it. They had a bully. deal with the bully. Yeah. And then uh, there'll be a little fat kid that'll be a comedian mm -hmm. next to her. Yep. That's mm -hmm. what happened in my case. You know why <laughs> I have an excessive need to talk on a podcast for three hours? Because oh, I was bullied. <laughs> Yep. I will. I'm, I will be heard. Okay. Yep. I was bullied up until I figured out how big I was. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I never knew because I was like I was always tiny, short, and fat, and I never knew when I had my massive growth spurt. I didn't know anything changed that much. So, lesson for you: if you don't want libertarian podcasts, be nice to every kid. <laughs> uh, that's just ridiculous. It's human nature. Like you're never going to. Legislate away human nature. Stop it. You're all fucking ridiculous. If your child goes to a school that tries to do this, 
you must immediately remove them. It is your duty as a good parent. Uh, all right, final thoughts for this episode, Harry. Um, final thoughts for the episode. When it, all right, so when it comes to like a when. Okay, a lot of the things, a lot of the things that can be explained through the things that happen in other countries besides the United States can like you can just quick Google search, duck, 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 go search, search and look at the history and see all the things that have happened to this country and understand how it got to this point. And a lot of the things that, you know, could just, if you cross-reference the dates and times, you can see how it was just kind of, it was made to be this way. Right. Uh, and if you want things to change, well, you know how to change the things. Best thing to get that thing to pull a third world country out of its crap hole is to capitalism. That's so yep. I, that's the that's the only freaking way. Um, if you don't, you know, it, it's the only thing that has done anything that's pulled anybody up. Other than that, it's you know everything just it kind of just stays the same. It is the way. Yeah. It's just no, 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 <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, the other thing is um, always remember um, take everything written from babe.net with a grain of salt. Uh, the flight of fancy article has gone around everywhere. I, I'm waiting. Uh, I'm still gonna. I'm just going to hold my breath and wait for it to come out as a hoax or things to be elaborated on. Just kind of like the Canadian girl who got her, uh, tried to get her job cut with scissors, <laughs> you know, or the other million other cases that, you know, when someone says some ridiculous claim and you can, go, you know, look at that and go like, I, that didn't happen. Yeah. yeah that didn't happen. Because <laughs> it just, that just sounds too ridiculous, you know, or there's things missing. Um, the other thing I want to go back on is don't forget on Wednesday we are going to stream on Twitch. You know, I want to get through it at seven, but it seems like with these frigid cold temperatures, um, uh, Lacey is only getting home around is getting home late, so she's not able to take Gunther mm -hmm. early enough for me to allow me to stream. Right. So, like I said, you know, so make sure you guys, you know, if you see her around or see anything, you know, tell her thank you because she's taking another night to let me go out and do other things. She doesn't yeah. have to. She gave, she worked all day. She deserves some time to herself. But right. you know, she knows I enjoyed this, and she knows you guys enjoy this. So if you guys see her around or see someone see her around, out there on the internet, give her the claw. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give her the buff. Get your hand broken. Um, <laughs> right, that's the woman you want to marry. You want to man like you give me the claw. I'm breaking your hand. Yeah, yeah, breaking your hand. Yeah, or you know, I I, I like strong women. Um, me too. You know, I think I got Lacey to squat close to 200 pounds one time. <laughs> you know, I like them strong. <laughs> I wanna, you know. <laughs> Good genetics in the legs. Heck yeah. yeah, you, know, yeah. Like, so many, you know how many times I've been drunk in Broad Ripple and had Lacey carry me to the car? Okay? <laughs> you are the woman in the relationship, aren't you? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm drunk, carry 